met a few of you before. And uh, I'm a solutions engineer, so I work with Dawn, and, and we cover uh, all of North Carolina and all of Virginia. And we go around and do a lot of uh, presentations and talking with customers. And uh, today, uh, the, presentation uh, the presentation we're going to be doing is covering ArcGIS Online. And I know that many of you, if not all of you, have uh, used ArcGIS Online in some capacity. Uh, but some of you may be some power users of it, and then there may be some of you who are really just brushing the surface of what that is. And so the presentation I'm going to go through today is going to be kind of an all-encompassing kind of thing. And since this is scheduled to be like three hours long, uh, I'm try to keep it light and casual. And I've got some uh, humorous slides and things in here as well. So uh, honestly, if you have questions, if you've got something that's not going to take us too far off uh, on a rabbit trail or off topic, then I think Please feel free to, to feel free raise your hand to or just shout it out and be glad to, to go through some things again. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and really, let's just kind really of have some fun with this and, and, and get through uh, some of the things I want to talk about. Now, I know as, as a regional councils of government, as things are slightly different in some ways than many of the, the local government that Don and I talk, to, uh, talk to on a regular basis, but many of the, the services and the things that, that you all provide in terms of GIS are are very similar. Very similar. And so, and so uh, since 99% uh, of who I work with are local with governments, governments, that's really what that's this really is focused on. on. But I think, but I think uh, you guys are a real bright group. You'll be able to, uh, to figure out any, any discrepancies between, uh, you know, what you do and what a, a standard local government would provide. And, um, and um, you know, the, 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 uh, the Workflows and things Workflows that I'm going to talk about are focused on. I'll do some on fire. I'll do some on public safety. Some on parks and rec. Uh, but the idea uh, here is really not to really not to, uh, to say, oh, well, this is the way you have to do things, or that this particular workflow will only work for the fire department, or will only work for the planning department, or whatever it happens to be. It's rather just to to give. Uh, uh, a way of doing a way of something, doing a way of showing this to you, instead, instead of just doing feature function. function. Here is a, a button on ArcGIS Online, and this is what it does, and move on to the next one. That's pretty boring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with an overview of ArcGIS Online, and just kind of some of the main functions of it. So just in case you're not familiar with it, or if you need to re-familiarize yourself with it, uh, then uh, you know we'll get that out of the way. And then the rest of the time, I'll, I'll talk about some use, uh, use cases and some of the technology that's behind ArcGIS Online, uh, and then that way with the, the beginning piece, you'll kind of understand where I'm coming from. So, uh, what is ArcGIS Online? If you're not familiar with it, uh, the whole idea behind the platform is to give you an easy way of sharing uh, your data, your maps, and your web mapping applications, uh, whether that is internally within your own organization, uh, or whether that is uh, externally to uh, a client of yours, or even to the public itself. Uh, and, uh, and we accomplish, we that, accomplish via, that via uh, ArcGIS uh, Online, which ArcGIS is a cloud-based cloud kind of cloud structure. But um, essentially what that means is it gives you a, a one-stop shop one that you can log into and, and then say, hey, I want to uh, add some data to this map, data and I want to share that with whoever that happens to be. Um, <clears throat> one, of one of the focuses that I want to talk about today is to do a, what I would just call it a GIS health check. And, uh, you, and you may uh, recognize you these may recognize friendly faces up on the screen as Fred Flintstone and George Jetson. And, and uh, we kind of and, uh, drew up a profile of these two, of these two uh, particular uh, characters, characters uh, because they were pretty uh, much were pretty um, um, the complete opposites complete of one another. Fred Flintstone Fred worked in a rock quarry. He was in the Stone, in the Stone Age, and the things that he did were very much old school ways of doing things. You can look at some of the things that he did. All of his workflows were complex. His method of communication was a stone tablet. Yeah. That, uh, you know, etch something on there so that someone could read it. Um, he drove with his feet, um, and and all the work that he did was just an old school way of doing things. And then on the other side of things, you've got George Jetson, and he was in the future, right? Technology was uh, was the mainstay of everything that they did. And uh, we don't have to go through all of these things that are here, but anybody remember where uh, George Jetson worked? Nobody. 
Thank you. It's basically sprockets. And so uh, while, um, you know, you look on the left side and you've got Fred Flintstones who's breaking rocks and basically his job is monotonous one thing over and over and over and over. He's not providing a useful end product to someone. And he said, I've got split parcels up there. And, and that's obviously not a bad thing. Everybody's got to split parcels or do something like that. But if you don't have a return on investment from that, if you don't have a, uh, an information product that you're producing from what it, whatever it is you're creating, creating then you're not then you're providing, providing the full value, value that you could, could be. And so you look on the other and side at George Jetson, he builds, uh, built sprockets, uh, built it's basically space sprockets, and those were useful products, something that can be plugged into an end goal and actually create something out of it. If you go down the list and look at some of this stuff, uh, communication, again, Fred Flintstone used a stone tablet, it was a uh, uh, you know, a static, uh, static thing. Once you carved it, it's done. done. You can't, can't do anything, anything else, with, anything else it. with it. Whereas George Whereas Jetson George used Jetson live video calls. Live I thought video that was kind of interesting because uh, this is uh, the Jetsons came uh, out in the, the 60s, the 60s and that was well before yeah, was well live before video calls live were actually a thing that you could do. And so they were actually do. thinking ahead of the future. Um, and the reason I brought this up is because we have the ability to do dynamic maps now. Rather than taking a PDF document or a screenshot of like a JPEG or a PNG or something like that and embedding that into a website site or giving that to someone or even printing out a static map, the issue with that is that once you print it, once you export it, um, you have, you have uh, you know, basically uh, a static image of it. You have a static snapshot and it's out of date. From the moment you hit print, from the moment you hit export, it's out of date. Versus something like a dynamic map, something that you can embed it's live, uh, a live link to your database, a live link back to your services, uh, you're always seeing the most up-to-date information. So we don't have to spend too much time on Fred and George. What I really wanted to put this up here for is to give you something to remember. You know, I think at the end of the three hours that we'll spend together, um, if there's one thing you can take away from this is, are you going to be a, a, a Fred Flintstone or are you going to be a George Jetson in terms of technology and how you, you take it and use it? Are you going to continue exporting and using static information or are you going to take that information that you have that can be live, that can be uh, dynamic and, and take it and, and and mold something out of it. So obviously that all leads up to, well, how can we be George Jetson and how can we uh, use live, dynamic, up-to-date information? And we're going to focus on ArcGIS Online today. Maybe we'll just skip that for a second. And uh, we'll go over here to ArcGIS Online because I was going to do that anyway. Online, do that and uh, we're going to kind of go through an overview of ArcGIS Online and just some of the high level things just level to make sure just to that make you sure haven't already, you, haven't already uh, uh, you know, uh, played around with it or seen kind of some of the basics of it. And this will kind of cover those things. But the main things I want to talk about are number one, the organization of ArcGIS Online. Uh, because that's uh, because one of the main backbones of ArcGIS Online are the users, are the that, users make that make it's it up. It's not designed to be not used by just uh, one person, uh, one person who's, who's going to do all the work and the make work all the maps and, and um, you know, you know, handle all the burden, all the burden um, by themselves because you're going to be able to take that effort and whether you've got somebody who is collecting information in the field or whether you have someone that is you know creating maps and embedding them into a website or you have someone that's doing data editing or looking at an operations dashboard so you're getting a high-level view of things. Level There's a lot of different ways that we can uh, use ArcGIS Online, and different, and different users are going to use it in a different way. And so and these so members that you see here, I realize as a, as a, as a part, part of the uh, NCARC, NCARC, these regional, these regional uh, councils of government, you've got a slightly different uh, model, model than what uh, uh, we typically uh, see typically using ArcGIS Online. Online. But, never, but nevertheless, 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 you're going to have individual, individual members that are contributing to the organization. And then the other, the other backbone, backbone, if you will, of ArcGIS, of ArcGIS Online uh, are the groups uh, are the that, group make up, that make up uh, the, sharing uh, the sharing capability. capability. So, so um, you may um, all you may already all be already using be some using groups of some, groups state, of some shape or form, form but, but these groups are what enable you to uh, decide who can see what, how you can share uh, different content within ArcGIS Online. I like to use groups in a couple different ways. Number one, a group can be used 
It's a simple, simple way of, way of uh, categorizing, categorizing information. information. You can see I've got a group yeah, here got a group called here Public Map public Gallery, map gallery. Can, or I've got or one, I've got uh, one uh, called base maps. Base maps. Those are pretty self-explanatory self as to what, to what a, a that group that does. They, does. They, they hold either public either maps or they hold or they base hold maps. And if I open this up, I'm looking for a particular base map, then I can go to this group and I'm going to be able to find it. So it's a category. Another way I can use it is to to use it to mimic a department or a workflow or a typical type of of workflow that people might accomplish. And so something like emergency management, fire rescue, health, law enforcement. You can see these different groups that are here, and each one of these groups kind of mimic that type of workflow or that type of requirement or specialty within an organization and what they might need to accomplish. And so you can create a group to kind of keep those like things together. And then the third way that you can use a group is you can use it to manage the, the privacy or the security of the content that you are talking about sharing. So for example, if I open this fire rescue group and I take a look over here on the right side of the screen, you can see that I have 17 members of this group. And if I set this to be a private group, then only the 17 members that are listed in this group are going to be able to see uh, the content that is listed here. So if my name is not one of the 17 uh, names that's listed here, then I won't even see the fire rescue group, much less, much less any of the content, the content inside of it. Inside of and that content, that content can be um, a, a map a service, it can be a web map that you've created, it could be a web application, it could be a, a, number, of a number of different things, different things, things that you put in there. Put in there. Uh, and that's the uh, way that the, the, the security, security model is handled, handled, handled for ArcGIS Online. It's a really simple process. You could create as many groups as you want. If you just had some uh, you know, some test stuff that you're working on, you just wanted to share it with a couple people before you uh, you put it out to, uh, to uh, one of your, your customers or to the public or whoever it is, then um, you, know, you can create that group and say, hey, just invite one or two people to it and let's use this kind of as a sandbox or a staging environment. And when you're done with it, just delete it. It doesn't have to be a complicated process and it doesn't have to be permanent. Okay, sounds like we're having okay, issues, like we're having with, issues with, with audio, audio back, and forth. back and forth. All right. All right. I apologize for people. Apologize for people. people. Okay. Yeah, so let's take a look at, uh, a look like, at our, uh, like our public, uh, maps, gallery, public maps gallery, for example. We'll open that up. We'll open that up. And uh, in this particular and, uh, case, this particular sense case, of a this public map, map gallery, um, obviously, um, the um, obviously the maps and all the content in here are intended to be available to anyone. Available so you can see the status of this group is public. In that case, anybody can see it. So you don't have to be a particular username to see that particular content. But maybe you have a group that you want to be available to all of the COGS. Maybe you've got some common data. Uh, that, you that you want everybody to be able to see. Um, yeah, um, that'll link it yeah, to, link uh, it or, or like the, the uh, fire rescue the, group, where you, you have it linked directly link back to the, the back users to the that are listed in that. So, so yeah, when I, when I go to a group, any group, and I say I want to invite a member to it, If I want to invite a member to it, member then I can come up here and I can type a name. So I type in Dawn, I hit enter, and it's going to give me a list of, you know, all the people named Dawn in my organization. I just click the name, adds it to my invitation list, and then I can add them to that group. And so they're linked together. So the, the last piece that I want to cover in this little section is uh, my content. Uh, and so just like any other uh, like online type of, of website that you might go to that has a username and password, just like ArcGIS Online, whether it's you know, your email, whether it's Facebook, whether it's a wish list that you have on Amazon.com, uh, usually there's some uh, content store capability tied to uh, that username and password that says, hey, this is my version of this website that I'm seeing. And GIS online, online is no different. Is different. Uh, my, content uh, my content is where you access where you that access stuff. So everything that you see on this page, this all the folders and all the folders, items all that you see in this list, are things, things that I have either created have or added or to ArcGIS Online. Arch online. And, this and this is where I get to control, to control uh, their status. Uh, their so status. for example, if you so take a look at this top item in this list, it's a web mapping application, and you can see it's not shared with anyone. And that's the default status for anything on ArcGIS Online. The only person who can see it is the creator of 
of that content. It's just a safety mechanism. You have to explicitly say, I want to share it with someone. But once you're ready to share it, you simply click the share button. And the dialog box that comes up uh, allows you to uh, specify who you're going to share it with. And so you can go as fine-grained as an individual group. Let's say I wanted to share this with my fire rescue group. I just check the box for that or multiple groups. Um, and, and that's, and that's and the way I can handle it for a specific group of people. Group of people. Or I can say or I want to share it with my entire organization. In this case, it would be all of the regional councils of government. I could check that box. Uh, or the top box that's up there, share that with everyone. That is, share it with the public. And when I do that, that eliminates all of the uh, authentication, the credentials uh, requirements. So that would be in the case of, oh, I've created a public, a publicly accessible web map that I want citizens of a particular municipality to be able to see. Um, when I check that box up there, uh, they'll be able to click that link. If they have the URL, or if I've embedded it in the middle of someone's website, um, then they won't need any credentials in order to see that. But if I don't have that box checked, that it's box going to prompt me for a username and password. It's on to be a member of the ArcGIS online organization in order to see that. So this is the sharing dialog, and you see that uh, whether you're here at the My Content screen or really uh, on pretty much any uh, part of ArcGIS online that you go to, uh, when you click the Share button, this is the options that you get. And so this is kind of the basics so kind of, of the basics ArcGIS of Online uh, that I wanted to, to make, uh, sure make sure that everyone has at least a, a, a minimal level of understanding. Level of understanding. Most of you probably have at least seen probably part of this before. Of this before. Um, and so that way, um, when we go way, through some other things and, and I show you some show stuff, you it won't be brand new, like, oh, how did you do that? Um, and so that's kind of the high level of ArcGIS Online. Of course, we're going to see some building some maps later on, so we'll get into that piece of it. But for now, we've covered some of the intro part of it. So what I want to go to next are some some of the, some uh, of the, uh, the case, uh, case studies that, that I, I told you that I'd get into. Get into. Uh, the first one that I'm going to get into is ArcGIS Online for Fire. Now, again, um, I, I put ArcGIS Online for Fire, and what we're going to cover is a mobile data collection kind of workflow. I've based this one around fire, but you can imagine mobile data collection can be important for anything, whether it's utility, whether it's a parks and rec, whether it's uh, fire, whether it's police, or whoever it happens to be. I had to pick one, and I can't go into detail on every single thing. So use this as an idea. If you've got other ways that you can do mobile data collection, then absolutely, um, you know, that could be applied here. Uh, but in the case of ArcGIS Online for Fire, what we're going to take a look at is pre-incident planning. Um, and a typical uh, fire typical, department uh, pre-incident pre plan, plan is, uh, is uh, a, a drawing a or a, uh, an as-built of, of a building where it simply has simply the, the has building the structure, building structure um, and like uh, entry points, entry points um, shutoffs, um, shutoffs for gas, electric, electric and water, and water um, fire department, uh, fire department connections, connections, sprinkler system sprinkler shutoffs, all that type of stuff that a, if I'm a battalion chief and I'm showing up in a building that's on fire and I'd like to know this before I send my crew in there so they're not dealing around blindly into this building. So that's a something that a lot of fire departments like to have for all the commercial buildings or uh, government buildings in an area, just because they usually have large layouts that would be difficult to find uh, things just by stumbling around blindly. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to head over to my uh, fire rescue group. I'm going to take a look at one of the maps that uh, I've created for this pre-incident planning. Let me scroll down here to the bottom and we'll go ahead and open up this web map. And the data we're going to take and a look at happens to be at in Martin be County, in Florida. Martin County um, Florida. Just, um, they were kind enough to let me see some of their, uh, have some of their data, data as a sample. And um, uh, so uh, we are obviously going to be focused in and around there. I'm not sure what's going on with my internet. It might be a requirement that I switch to your Wi-Fi because mine's not being. We'll, we'll try it for a little bit longer. but. That's rough. <laughs> All right. So, um, right. so in this particular um, case, the, the purple the outline that you see here is a pre-incident plan. This happens to be an L.A. fitness building. And, um, and uh, you know, if I click on the building, I can get some information about it. I can see the site address, the building class, uh, the contact information. If anybody's wondering what Emmett Smith's up to today, uh, I guess apparently he owns L.A. fitness building in Martin County, Florida. But I can see the, the contact information, email. Um, well, we'll just keep with that. Um, some of the other things that are on here are uh, attachments. So if I wanted a photo of this building, if I wanted to see the original as built, uh, maybe I have some diagrams of the floor plans, things like that um, that I'd like to attach to this particular uh, feature, I can certainly do that. One example here is this PDF that I'll, I'll launch. 
And uh, the funny and, thing about uh, this is this PDF you see, which, which is obviously hand-drawn, hand um, was the original um, pre-fire or uh, pre-incident uh, pre plan that the Martin County Fire Department was using. Um, they actually went out, they sketched the picture of the building, and you can see, well, there's an entry point, there's a pool, there's some chemicals that they use for the pool, an elevator, all that type of stuff. And they had photocopies of this in each fire truck that might have to respond, um, and they had photocopies of it, and so when they would respond to a fire, they would have to dig through this box, locate this piece of paper, and then, you know, show it to people who might need to be going into this building. The battalion chief would obviously take a look at it, and this was kind of their first due information that they would take a look at. Um, they recognize this they recognize is really this not the best really way of doing, doing things. things. Um, like um, I said, it's like a static said, map. Static map. Um, they got to redraw, gotta redraw it, it, re photocopy it. it. What, what happens if they lose it? Lose it? What happens, what happens if, they, if, they if it gets destroyed? destroyed? What happens if they what just happens file it back in the wrong box and later on they can't find it? There's a lot of downsides to this particular approach. So they scanned it in and then they had a whole digitizing project where they went through for all of their building footprints and they. They, uh, they updated, updated them, so they have a, a digital have a, access for that. But so you, now you can see I've got a digital can, building. Got a it digital also building. has all of the uh, extra, information extra information that came along with that. Along with and so that. now I can look and at this building and I can see all the green triangles up here on the map are the entry points. So I've got a double door, a single door, roof access, a rolling door at the back. The blue circles are electrical, are electrical gas, and gas water shutoffs. Shut I can see chemical areas and, and all that type of stuff. And this is a really quick really way to be able to take a look at a web map. Web in, map. This case, in this case, I'm looking at it on my laptop, on my laptop and I can see and this can information. See this information. And now I know where all the information is from this building. But to take that a step further and either hand this to the crew while they're out in the field. In the case of Martin County, all of their trucks are equipped with iPads. So they can open up the same map on their iPad in their truck. And now they've got their pre incident plan in a you know, digital a format, format which they can click they on and get all the information, all the information that they need. need. Take that another step, another for, step uh, further, uh, further and you can, and you can uh, they uh, begin uh, using uh, this for building inspections. For building inspections. So, you know, so you can't just do a pre-incident plan one time and expect nothing to change. And so when they do their yearly inspections of buildings uh, and they send an inspector out there, they can take an iPad and take the same web map and update it if needs be. So what I want to do, and my apologies to people on the phone because I have no way of projecting this, um, <laughs> but I'm going to show a mobile workflow um, using my iPad. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, Melinda just Melinda suggested, suggested that people on the phone, if, if you can if you mute can your uh, speakers, uh, speakers, if you haven't already, that already, may help. We've got a little bit of feedback, feedback going on here. On here. Um, but basically, um, I'm going to show, show, hopefully, hopefully. unplug that. Melinda did it before. Might not. Oh, there it goes. Oh, All right. Good. Thank All right. you. Thank you. What I'm going to show is an application called Collector for ArcGIS. It's a part of ArcGIS Online. So if you have an ArcGIS Online account, uh, username and password, then you can download this application for uh, whatever mobile device you have, whether it's an iPad, an iPhone, an Android tablet, or an Android phone. You can go to whatever store, Google Play or iTunes, and you can type in Collector, and you'll find the Collector for ArcGIS app. And, uh, and when you log when in, you with, log that in app, with that app, you're greeted with a page like this. Like now, now, all of the all maps and things that you see here are maps, are maps that, 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 number one, number I have one, access to have because um, I am a part, um, a member of those groups. Of those groups. And these and maps the that you maps see are maps that, that have that editable data, data inside, inside them that, them that I, can I can see. And so if I take so a look at this, this uh, obviously I see a lot of different maps, maps here. And if I click on the maps, maps button up here at the, the top left top corner, corner, I see a list of all the groups that I'm a member of. And so in this case, if I'm a, if I want to go to the fire rescue department, I can tap on that group, and now I see all the maps that are a part of that group that have editable data in there. And so you can see that one application. You can't see it over there. Oh, oh, it came unplugged. I'm sorry. Um, I'm trying to stay close to here because I get the feedback if I stand over there. Trying to stay close to here. There we go. All right. 
Right. So the applications so the that you see on the screen here are, screen are, are all part of the Fire Rescue, Rescue group, and they are all have they some they type of editable, editable data, data source that's in there. That's in and there. so you can see, so you can I can use one application, one application, in this case, the collector application, and it would allow me to do pre-incident planning. It would allow me to do an inventory of automated external defibrillators, AED. I could do a fire safety survey. I could do a damage assessment. I could do a fire hydrant inspection. And these are just a few that I've put in here for the Fire Rescue Department. Um, but um, as, but an, as, uh, as, as a user, user of this user iPad, say I'm in a, a fire truck and I'm doing some data collection or I'm the building inspector going out to do the pre-incident plan, I can tap on the pre-incident plan uh, item that's here and it's going to open up the same map that we just saw on the website side of things and now we can see the same building, that same LA Fitness building and of course I can tap on any of the features here and I can see that same pop-up information that came with it, this. If I need to edit, I can do that. Or, let's say I'm a building inspector, I show up to the LA Fitness building to do my annual uh, run through, and the first thing I notice is right next to that double door at the front of the building, uh, there's a Knox box. The Knox box is just a key box that the fire department uses, it's got the key for the building in it, and the fire department has a master key that they can unlock the box and get in after hours in case of emergencies or whatever. That would be a good thing to know where it is on the building. Well, you notice on my map, I don't have that Knox box located. If I'm the inspector and I see one, I can simply use this collector application, add a new feature and say, all right, these are all the features I have the ability to add. I'm going to click on Knox box. And now I just and need to add a few things. things. Number one, the geometry. geometry. Were I in were Martin I in County, in I'm not. County. Were I in Martin, Martin County, County, I'd be able to use my County. GPS to, to, to locate me there. Locate or I can simply or tap can simply on the map or hold on the map and actually and add the geometry to the map. I can fill out can fill uh, the attributes uh, are the, the next thing, so, next thing. so um, if I needed to, uh, to pick a particular to, type of Knox box, box, like a Knox box, box or a Supra locked box, box, I can do that. Can do that. I can fill I can out the fill attributes out the if I have some comments, have comments um, about, about that. I can type in, you know, left of the double doors or whatever I need to do there. So now I've got the geometry and I've got the attributes and those are required. Then the third thing, which is optional, is I have the ability to add an attachment. Just like I showed you the PDF of the hand-drawn transit plan, I can do the same thing from my iPad. IPad. And I can and just I can use just my camera to take a photo, photo, or I can photo, choose from the library, from the library. And, uh, and I will uh, pick one I've already got. So that's a Knox box. If you've never seen one before, I'll show it to you. Um, or I can use the camera here, and we'll take a photo or a video. And uh, it's a cheese. And uh, we'll use that. So I can actually have multiple photos attached to uh, a single feature. And now that I've got the geometry, the attributes, and the optional pictures, I can click the Submit button. And it's going to send those updates back to uh, the, the service, or back to my database. Uh, using my uh, Wi-Fi, my 3G or 4G data connection, whatever I happen to have out on the field. It's going to also upload those photos, so depending on the size of them, it could take a little bit. Um, and ultimately, that's updating uh, the database side of things. Um, one other thing I can do, now notice I said when I hit the submit button, it's actually using my Wi-Fi or my, my broadband connection to add that information back. One of the things that we immediately got feedback on is, well, hey, my device doesn't have broadband, or I'm in a rural area that doesn't have broadband, or I'm in a damage assessment, disaster recovery type of scenario where maybe uh, the cell towers are all down and I don't have that type of uh, data connection. Well. We also gave the ability, if we head back here to um, uh, my maps list, you'll notice on some of these uh, little boxes, you can see a little cloud icon. So what that allows me to do is, let's say I was going to do a damage assessment. You see the one below that's got the cloud icon. If I tap on that, I can say I want to download a base map. And I can choose an area that I want to work in. And I can say, all right, well, this is my damage assessment area that I'm going to be working with. I can choose. So that's the extent. I can choose how detailed I want the, the map to be. And then I hit the download button. It'll download the map cache or the, the, the base map and my operational data on top of that to my device. I can go out in a completely disconnected environment, do my data connection uh, collection. And then once I get back to the office or to Starbucks and use their free Wi-Fi or whatever I'm going to do, and then I can hit the synchronize button and it'll send all of the deltas of the, the data collections that I've done. So this application is pretty powerful because again, it's a one-time download and you can create as many focused uh, applications or focused maps for doing data collection. 
Notice this is fire rescue. What if I went to water utilities, for example? You see I've got a ton of different maps in here, and each one of them has a very specific purpose. I have one for valve exercising, one for backflow inspection, one for inland inspection, and so on and so forth. Each one of these can be a completely different project. So if you have a shared device, um, you can still use this, even across departments or completely different workflows, you're in, it enables you to do that. And it'll work in that disconnected environment. You can add a new features, point find or polygons, um, or you can update existing ones that are there. Um, so you got a lot of capability uh, with, with this particular device. So now that we've done that, let's go back to my laptop. Right, so uh, the cloud option is basically it's a checkbox on the web map that you've created. So in this case, like my pre-incident map did not have that cloud option there. And uh, that was because it's just an option in the, uh, not moving over. It's just an option on the web map when I say I want to be able to work offline. It's just a checkbox, and it really just prevents somebody from downloading uh, the data if you didn't want them to do that for, for whatever reason. Just a checkbox. It's a free download. If you go to the App Store, it'll be free, completely free. The only thing it requires is that you have a username and password for ArcGIS Online. So if you're already a member of the organization, you can use it for no additional fee. It's free. So, so that's a good point, so, point that Carol just made. Um, the, made uh, the, the, there is the organization-wide organization uh, account, uh, account that the NCARC that has. The has. But, but individually as COGS, individually if you have you any have ArcGIS, ArcGIS desktop, desktop software, software that, that is that on maintenance, maintenance then, you then you have an ArcGIS, an ArcGIS online, online username for each one of these. So let's say you had five ArcView, the basic level licenses that are on maintenance, and you have five ArcGIS online usernames. Uh, it, doesn't uh, it doesn't matter what the license, what the license level is, level basic, is standard, basic standard or advanced. advanced. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's single whether use or concurrent use. You have you one have per. One and, per. And, and everything that I'm showing today, today um, the um, collector app, website, the website everything, everything is exactly, exactly the same for those, same for those as it is as for, it is the, for organization the organization wide uh, account. Uh, so those things are available. It also. It's not available for Surface at this time. It's, it's for Apple and and Android. Yeah. Yeah. So so that is a good point in case people on the phone uh, couldn't hear that. Uh, the question was about uh, Windows products, uh, like the Surface tablets. Uh, the Collector app currently is for Apple iOS devices and uh, Android. It's not currently run on a Windows platform, um, but we've been getting more and more feedback recently uh, about people using that, especially from an IT stand standpoint, and support for it. Um, and so that is something that our development teams are gathering. Requirements, requirements for. for. We, we have absolutely, have absolutely no, no time frame, no time frame ETA for when that when might, that might uh, be uh, out, be out. Um, um, but, but, but it is something that they're doing requirements, requirements gathering for. Gathering so it's, for. it's so a possibility, possibility for, for, for a future release. Future release. But, for but for now it's iOS, iOS or Android. Android. All right. All right. So if we take a look take back a look at this back map that we just at, we just did our editing on there, we just pan this map to update it. We should see our Knox box show up. Should. Come on, Knox Box. Come on, Knox Box. Don't fail me now. Don't fail me now. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. All right. All right. So our Knox box showed up next to the front door. If we tap on it, we should see the information that we put in there. We can see the, the photo that I took of uh, the crowd here. And then we can see the uh, what an actual Knox box was. If you were wondering what they look like, you may have seen one of these on the side of a building before and wondered what it is. That's what this is. It's a key box for the fire department to be able to get into to unlock the doors if they need to. All right. So that whole workflow can be accomplished by creating a web map. Um, if you haven't already realized this or, or haven't used them very often, then um, this web map is what pretty much everything in ArcGIS Online is based off, is, uh, off of. It's the centralized component of ArcGIS Online, whether it's a, a web application you're going to build, whether it's a collector application that you're going to build something based off of, whether you're going to embed something into another website. Uh, this 
Web map is the web container that brings all of the data la layers together. So there's really two pieces of a web map. There's the base map. In this case, I'm using the imagery that's in the background. And you can use your own imagery if you have access to a base map that you've created, or any type of base map, really. Or you can use one of the base maps that Esri provides. We provide imagery, street maps, topographic maps, um, and then a few kind of more specialized use cases, like a light gray map or a national geographic map. There's a few of them that are out there. Uh, so you can either mix and match. You can use only Esri, or you can use only your own. It's entirely up to you. So that's one that's component one of the web map, is the base map. map. It's, it's really map. just your frame really of just reference for what you're looking at. And then the other component, the other of course, are the operational layers. layers. In this in case, for our pre-incident pre plans, plans, it's the knock it's boxes, the, boxes, the building footprints, the, uh, you know, the uh, shut-offs you know, shut and all of that. that. And that's obviously the information that you're really out to query or to edit, is what you want this map to be based off of. So that whole process doesn't have to be difficult. In fact, when you set up a map for Using with Collector using in a mobile, mobile data, data environment, there's nothing, there's nothing special, special that you have to do have to, do to the, do map the map to make it to make mobile it enabled. Um, when, um, I when I create a map, map I've got my base got map and I've added my layers to it. I click the save button, I save as. In this case, I'd already saved it as pre incident planning. And then if you click the share button, you can already see that this particular map is shared with emergency management, fire rescue, and law enforcement. That's it. Yep. This map happens to be shared with all three of those groups. So if I'm a member of any one of those, Groups, groups, I'll be able to I'll see, able this, see map this map on whatever, whatever device, whatever I, device happen I happen to be using. To be using. And once I've and shared once it, I've that's shared all I have to do. I'm now able, able to open this in the collector app. I'm now able to open this on a website or wherever it happens to go. So there's nothing special that you need to do to make the map mobile enabled. The only uh, difference is, uh, like Melinda brought up, is that if you want to do the offline data editing, it's just a checkbox on the, the individual uh, web map that says make this available offline. And I'll show you that real quick just so you can see it. Um, you go to the pre incident planning or whatever map you happen to have, and you, have, and you click edit, edit, and you scroll down to the bottom, to the bottom and, you and you can see enable offline mode, mode. Uh, right there. It's just a right checkbox, and check you can box. see mine didn't have the cloud didn't before, have the cloud because before, because it wasn't checked. Wasn't checked. Right. Okay, so let's okay. go back to so here. Were there any questions here. about that before I move on to the next one? I can certainly do that. That's, I, I mean, and, and I don't have a particular spot where I was going to be talking about data sources. Um, so, I mean, we can actually cover that a little bit right now if you'd like, um, since it is relevant to a lot of what we're going to be doing. Um, any, any type of data source for ArcGIS Online um, is going to pretty much require it to be a service. There are instances where you can take a shape file, for example, and you can upload it like a shape file points, for example, and you can zip it and you can say add it to my map. But what happens when you do that directly to the map is it converts it to a graphic. Um, and um, that graphic, and that graphic is, now is now just a static, static snapshot, snapshot of it. Of it's it. not it's something not that you're going to be able to, to, uh, to collaboratively, collaboratively edit, edit between, between multiple, multiple different, different people. people. Uh, ideally, uh, what you what would you want, want to do is you would want to turn it into a service. service. And there's and two ways that you ways can do that. do that. Some of you Some may of have, you access have access to ArcGIS, ArcGIS Server, server uh, and, uh, and, and I would and recommend that, that as, as your as primary, primary resource uh, for doing it, because you've already got it, it's on your architecture, it's what you, what you decided, you decided to, use to use to host it, it. and you would publish you would that service just like you would any other service for when you use ArcGIS Server. And in that case, let's say I have... Let's say I've got some, services, got some here. services here. I'll take a look at some. This is an ArcGIS server, server that I've got running in the Esri Charlotte, Charlotte office, and I've got a service like this damage assessment like service, service, here. service here. I can copy I can this copy URL. This I can go over to ArcGIS Online, and I can say I want to add a new item to ArcGIS Online. I want to add it from the web, and I just need to paste in that URL to that service. And all this is doing is is telling ArcGIS Online that that server and that service exists. It's not copying. Copying, copying any data, any it's data, not, not um, uh, moving your data moving your up to the cloud. Up the cloud. It's simply it's saying simply that, saying that there's, this there's this damage assessment data layer, data layer and it resides at this at URL, and this is how you can access it. So anybody who wants to add this to a web map can do so if I share that here. 
um, but but when they do when add they do it, it's going it, it's to point, point it back, back to my ArcGIS, ArcGIS server, server in order to do that. To do that. So that's one, that's method, one method that you can, that you can use for ArcGIS, for ArcGIS online. online. The other method, the other that, method that you can that use for adding data or adding a service. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and to, to, to that, that point, what happens what is happens if I had finished, finished that, that, that process of process adding that item and, and just clicking the add item button, add what would happen is I would then have an item, just, just like you see here in this like list, here in this that would have called, been called, called damage assessment, assessment, assessment or whatever I decided, or whatever to, call I decided to call it. And then if I chose to share that with you know all of the cogs, for example, then anyone who wanted to go and access that service can go to their map. They can say add a layer, and they could just do a search for damage assessment and add that to their map. And so what you can begin doing is kind of mashing up different data sources that are, may be coming from a variety of different locations, may all be pointing at a single server or whatever it happens to be, but they can be from different regions or whatever it happens to be. You can and and you then begin using ArcGIS Online almost as a, a content management system, which it can certainly be, and uh, the groups become ways of, of organizing that content, and the users become ways of handling who can can access that content, or if you just want everyone to be able to access it, then it just becomes a centralized repository for those data sources that can be useful for everyone. Mashing up different data sources that are maybe from a variety of different locations, may be pointing at a single server or whatever, whatever it happens to be. You can and and you then begin using ArcGIS. Yeah. So the question was, if you ha if you found a service of. of Whatever data uh, your, utility lines, for example, uh, something that you're interested in, rather than continuing to use the service, can you download that data uh, as a as a, a file structure, like a shape file or a file to your database? The the answer is um, yes, but it, it's up to the owner of that service to allow you or not allow you to do it. It's a checkbox, um, and but but I can allow a user to uh, export the data. So if I just click on any one of my layers that I've got here. Um, It would be a checkbox, and, and if I enable that, if I say yes, enable other users to, to download this data, um, then when you, for example, are interested in downloading this data and you click on that layer, there's an export button. And the export button says, do you want to export it as a shapefile? Uh, there's a newish function that allows you to download it as a file geodatabase um, or as a CSV file, I believe, um, is in there. Right. So, so what happens if, if he downloads the data from your region um, and then alters it and uploads it, he would not be overriding yours because you have the ownership access of that. If he re-uploaded it, then he would be creating his own copy of it. And, and so that is really where it's got to come down to, um, and, and that's where especially the, the, this, this kind of organization of the COGS are a slightly different use case because you you need uh, more governance kind of in place to just say hey look if you got this from another uh, region for example then then we need to have some rules in place that 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 decide who can upload that region's data for example you you obviously wouldn't want to have you have a, a copy and then he uploads another copy and now which one's the the original which one's the the correct data source.
common uh, uh, themes and uses. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, if you wanted to be able to, right, right, and, and that may be an example of what Scott was talking about when we were collaborating across the entire state and, and being able to, to do something there instead of having two different data sets that, that are trying to accomplish the same thing. All right, sorry, people right, on the sorry, phone are able, able, to, hear are able to hear me now. All right, All there, right. We there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love technology? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so to finish so up, to that, finish that, question, up that, though, that question, though, we do have the ability to use ArcGIS server, server, server if that's available to you. Uh, but in, uh, some, but circumstances, in some circumstances, if you don't have available you don't to you, or maybe you just need to do it on a project you level, a project you also level. have the ability to use ArcGIS online to host your data as a service, which can be editable, that can be exportable, that can be you can do collaboration with. And the method of doing that. It can be any it any be of those. Any, it can be online. It can be on a mobile device or on desktop that you would do your editing. The 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 well, so, so let me walk you through well, a scenario. So let Let's say you were going to create an application for an application damage assessment. For damage you would start on the desktop side of things, and you would create a file geodatabase, for example. And you would build the structure that you want in there with the, the features, 
the, the features, domains if you're going to put those values in there and all that type of stuff. And once you have the data set defined as you want it, then you need to turn that local data, file geodatabase, into a service that can then be accessed via the web. And the way you do that is from ArcGIS Desktop. You can use your ArcGIS Desktop to share it up to ArcGIS Online. And as long as you're at 10.1 or higher, you click File, Share as a Service, you'll log, log you in, you with, in your with your ArcGIS Online, Online credentials, and then kind of next, next, next. next, next, next. You have to start a desktop. You have, you have to, to have a data have structure data first. Structure Arch Jazz Online isn't going to create the data structure for you. Yep. But once you've got that, you've got you're that, able to use that that, uh, that, service, that service to power, to power well, like the damage well, assessment like the damage or whatever it happens to be. It, happens it can be points, be lines, or polygons. You have attachments. You can do all the stuff that we talked about before. So you got two different directions to go. You can use Arch Jazz Server. I would recommend that if you have it and have access to it. But if you don't have access, if you want to do it on a project-based level, you can certainly use Level, you can certainly use ArcGIS Online to do a feature service. So you can edit the attribute tables in ArcGIS Online? Um, yes, you're not going to be yes, you're not, gonna be not directly not to an attribute table. table. There's not going to be like I'm opening up the attribute table. I'm opening up the attribute table. I'm going to double click on the field that is coming up in there. Uh, that is coming, uh, but it's not currently uh, the, ability to edit uh, the ability to edit that. Right you would now. do it on a uh, you would do it on a feature by feature basis. So let me sorry. So that's the goal, so that's is the that, goal. that that non-GIS non -GIS people be able to do able this to without do this having any without GIS, GIS software. software. That's, that's, I mean, that's I, the GIS people who are the ones that are creating the data and possibly data and creating these applications. Creating but the end user, the end and that's a big goal of ArcGIS Online, is that the end user doesn't need to be the GIS professional. Exactly. Exactly. Use it. Yeah, use just, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Apps. Apps. That's, the That's the end goal. Everybody, Everybody loves, loves apps, apps now because of Apple and the, Apple the iPhone and the, that came the out with the app and realized how we can put it. Right. 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 Your requirement, Your requirement would be that you have an ArcGIS Online, Online, Online username uh, for sensitive information, uh, for sensitive unless it's just a publicly available, available, available thing. Available. That, and then once you've got that, you've then, got that you then you could just have a gallery of applications of that are, show me a dashboard of big number things, or give me an iPad application that I can can go in and check out you know this information, but I don't need any specialized software. And I'll show some examples show of that, some examples a little of that, bit later too, little bit of, later of, too of, the of the executive side. Executive of side. Of nope, that's why we're here today. Nope, that's why we're here today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the limit, um, right. the limit for the, uh, the file or the file uh, so if you upload an Excel uh, so file an or, Excel a spreadsheet, or a spreadsheet and you don't create, you a, don't service, create a service, then the limit, then the limit is 1,000 features. features. And the reason, and for, that the reason for that limit is because it, is because it creates a graphic that they're graphic basically drawing on the screen in your browser. And most browser. modern browsers most can't browsers handle more than about 1,000. In fact, Internet Explorer can't handle, handle more than about 750, and so we limit you there. It just gets too slow and clunky to draw it. Um, and so, um, if you, and do, so if you do choose the option to option turn it into a service, into a service then, then it's drawn server it's side server versus side client versus side. side. And you and can, there is no limit there is to the no number of features that you can put on there. Put on there. It's still, still, the default, default still, still limits it to limits drawing a thousand features at a time. You can override that. But for the most part, we would prefer that you handle that drawing via scale ranges. So if I've got a thousand points on the map at at this, this scale, scale level, level then, then I want to you know, change it so change that it's it, 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 not drawing not drawing basically. basically. And, and when you convert it to feature that is correct. That is correct. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. and that's great. So so and and we are going to cover that at the end. end. Um, um, yep. 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 
Route credits? Route credits? Go ahead and ask him. Go ahead and ask him. The web the application, web application is, going is going to use the to web, use map, the web map, to, map to for all of the, for settings. All of the settings. So it's so still it's going to still limit to you. Limit to, you to, it's not going to draw all of those parcels. All you have 50,000 parcels, 50, parcels that are attempting to draw at, draw at the full scale of a county or whatever it is. It's not going to draw all of those by default. If you go and override and say, I want to be able to draw 50,000 pictures at a time. Um, it's not um, going to draw all of those, all of those uh, by default, and it's going default, to recommend going that to you recommend set, a set a scale range. The web application, the web application that you build based off of that is going to fall under the same restriction. There is. When you create, the, is, service, when you create when you the service, it, the service, it, it, one, of it the, one of the questions, the questions in that little in that dialog box that comes box up is max feature count, and the default is 1,000. You can override it, but you would want to play around with that. See, if we're talking about Fifty thousand parcels. It might take a while to draw. It might take a while to draw. Um, um, so it just depends. So it just depends. Uh, that, that's going to be up to your that's discretion to, to, your discretion to determine to whether or not that's an acceptable not drawing time to you, or if you need to, to bump it down and, bump and play around with scale ratios a little bit more. Okay. All right. So, All right, so let me move on let to. Me move on to I'm not going to. I'm going to skip a section for a second because I know this is going to take a little bit longer, and I don't want to run into that lunchtime because people get cranky when they haven't eaten. So I'm going to go to. Actually, has a line for Parks and Rec. Actually, has a line for Parks and Rec. And take a look at some of the. Look at some of the. Uh, crowdsourcing capabilities, crowdsourcing of, capabilities of ArcGIS of, online. Of ArcGIS um, online. Um, you're all familiar with crowdsourcing um, concept. With concept. Getting a lot of people, and, uh, usually the general public, to contribute to a project, maybe unknowingly, maybe but, unknowingly, uh, but uh, basically uh, for basically bringing in information. It might be tree inventory, uh, tree like, hey, inventory, use your phone, like, hey, take a picture of the trees in your neighborhood, and we can contribute to this database. So rather than having to send a crew of people around through all these neighborhoods, you can use a large number Number of large to number of people to contribute to this database. We have some capabilities have some within ArcGIS Online to allow you to do some of that stuff. And a lot of the ways that's, that's come up has been through 311 type of applications. Uh, uh, things like, oh, there's a pothole in my street, or somebody stole, stole the street sign, or there's graffiti on this building, and that sort of thing. And giving someone an easy way of providing that information back so that you can go and handle that particular situation. Um, the, the issue the, there the issue has, there means that mean because we're relying, that because on, we're relying on, on the public in this case to, this case to handle this process, it's got to be very, very simple because you're not going to be there to show them this is how you do it. It also has to be very uh, easy and uh, quick to, to do it. Um, I had read an article a couple um, years ago that was, was talking ago, about, uh, about uh, iPhone, uh, and the iPhone and applications for the iPhone, and it was saying that the average person the average spends person 67, 67 seconds on an app. app. And if they haven't figured out how to use that app within 67, within 67 seconds, seconds, they delete it and they, they never it use it again. Never use it again. And then and it's just basically it's the, just way the way that consumer technology, consumer is, technology is, is these days. Now, unless that now, application unless that is just vital to your vital existence, to your then yeah, pretty then, much. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like, oh, this is too clunky or it's too confusing or there's too many buttons or it's slow or whatever it happens to be. It's longer than 67 seconds. Delete it. I'll find another one. I'll find another thing. Or I'll just do it. And that's that goes. Double, yeah, I think, double, for I think citizen for engagement citizen type of applications, type of because, applications because, because I'm already, if I'm a I'm citizen, and I'm, I'm thinking, citizen, and I'm oh, thinking, man, here I am trying man, to be uh, a, a good citizen and report this graffiti on the building or this overflowing you know, manhole, manhole or whatever it happens to be, happens then, to be then you know, then, I tried, you know, and, I tried and, and this is too complicated, and so too bad. You don't get my help. So we need to make it as simple as possible. And one of the ways of doing that is to not require them to 
or download an app. Because, because, because let me tell you, if I'm walking down my neighborhood, well, actually, my neighborhood, if I see a manhole that's overflowing or something like that, I'm likely to figure out some way to report that. It might be calling 311 or whatever it is. But something lesser, like, oh, there's graffiti on this sign, am I going to download my city web app that lets me report things, figure out how to use it, and then submit this? Probably not. So we need an easier way of doing it. And one of those ways is using a web application. Again, it's something that you open up in your browser, which means there's no download required to use it. But in that case, it needs to be a mobile-friendly type of app, because chances are I'm not carrying this out around when I'm walking on the greenway or down my neighborhood. So it needs to work on something like this that I've got in my pocket anyway. And so what we're going to take a look at is um, a citizen feedback type of application. In this case, um, the Mecklenburg County is, having, is currently having uh, some issues with coyotes. Uh, lots and lots of coyotes are showing up in parks, greenways, trails, and things like that. And people have been calling 311 and reporting these. Um, but the issue is, uh, how do you report where a coyote is um, you know, if it's in a park? Um, or, um, or, okay, I know I'm at William Davy Park. Park, I can say that. Um, but, what um, but what happens if you if are you on a greenway trail? Greenway I can say I'm on the four-mile creek greenway, 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 but that's a pretty but long, a trail. long trail. Um, I have a difficult um, time giving you an address as to where that is. And the county had come up with a Google Docs spreadsheet form that they had created that citizens could go to from the website and say their name and their email address and phone number, and this is the address that I saw the coyote. But again, if I'm on a greenway trail, I have no idea what the address is. I don't even know where I parked my car. I just know it's over there. And so I, they would just type in, you know, Four Mile Creek Greenway, halfway down. Halfway and it doesn't help at all for actually reporting the coyote, coyote sightings. And so what we're going to take a look at is an example of a web application that can be used in lieu of this Google Docs type of form that you put in there. And it provides an interactive map for uh, actually submitting the information. But it's designed in such a way that it'll work on somebody's phone and that it's so simple that anyone can do it without needing it somehow to give them directions on how to do it. So I'm going to walk you through the process. And this will, this will cover a couple of things. Number one, it'll cover how to create an actual an actual uh, map and uh, also map cover how to create a web application. A web application. So at this point, so this point um, I've started with uh, a base started map. With I just chose a, an image service, an uh, imagery base uh, map. And then if you click on any one of these, uh, these, uh, these coyote uh, footprint that you see here, you'll kind of get an idea get of an some idea of the data of that we're hoping to collect hoping with this form. Um, there is the name, uh, there is and the this name. is the, the this citizen's is the, name, the, the, the contact, contact information, information, and we're not forcing them to give us uh, a, a an email address or a phone number. It can be either, so it's just a text field. And in this case, uh, in my database, I can set this up where I have a required field, or I could just leave it as a non-required field, depending on how much information I want to force my user to give me. If I make it a required field, before they can submit this, they're going to have to fill out something there. This request information field that you see here is, is basically a, can we contact you for more information, yes or no. It's just a Boolean, you know, yes or no checkbox that they'll get. Um, and then a comments field or a notes field that's in there. And then you can also see that attachments are uh, enabled for this. So if we want someone to be able to take a picture, um, then they'll be able to do that from this, um, this particular application. So there's just the bare bones of an application, just really four different uh, potential entry points for someone to have to fill out. And, and you know, this is Mecklenburg County. These are some coyote uh, sightings that we've already got in there. Um, but what I want to do now, this has already been saved, coyote sightings. Map. I'm going to click the share button. And you've already seen that we've shared this with everyone because this is going to be a publicly uh, accessible map. This is the sharing process. And what we want to do is we want to make a web application. Now, if you haven't seen this before, ArcGIS Online provides uh, quite a few templates for out-of-the-box web applications. That's another pretty big focus for ArcGIS Online, um, is, uh, is actually focused maps and applications. We don't want the one-size-fits-all application. I'll get into that a little bit later on. But um, 
um, especially for especially something for like something this like sense and engagement type of application. It needs to be so focused that it does exactly what it needs to do, no explanation necessary, let's just get it over with. And so there's a bunch of these apps, a basic viewer that allows me to, um, you know, do measure tools, print tools, searching and stuff like that. Uh, there's an editing uh, application that's in here. We're basically taking this map that you see here in the background and we're fitting it into an application that gives you a limited number of tools so that it accomplishes so a single task a single rather task, than a one-size-fits-all thing that requires some explanation. The one we're going to take a look at here is this Geoform app. Geoform and one of the cool things about the these web application web templates application is they all work pretty much the same, same exact way. way. When you locate one that you're interested in, you click on the little drop-down box underneath it. Uh, there's three options. The first one is that we can preview what that application is going to look like. They're all powered by this web map that's in the background. But in this case, I can preview, oh, what's this Geoform look like? I can click that box and just kind of pop open a sample template and say, oh, that's what it looks like. Sounds good. Like I'll, go with that. I'll go with that. But then the other two options, the other two options either allow you to A, you to download the download source code the for the app. So if you wanted to download this, download host this on your own web on server, own web even server, customize it, they're all JavaScript. They're all JavaScript. If you wanted to customize, you wanted to customize them, them and add your own functionality, your own you could certainly do that. But that's not even a requirement because the first item that's up here is the ability to publish it directly to ArcGIS Online. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call this Coyote Society Engagement. App. App. Just click save and publish. Save and publish. And have it begin. Okay. Okay. Never seen that before. Never seen that before. Got it. Got it. That's a new one. That's a new one. Uh, Geoform. Uh, Geoform. Who knows? All right, so <laughs> save and publish. Save and publish. Apparently not. Um, so save and publish, and what happens is it launches a builder type of application. It allows you to go configure this. And so the first thing it's going to ask me for is what web map is powering this thing? Well, we started from the web map, and so it's already selected that for us. But if we had just started from the app, then we'd need to go out browse and find the one we want to use. In this case, we use our Coyote Sightings map. And click next. Click All right, which layer is right, editable? If we had multiple layers in here, then we would pick from those layers. But in my case, I really only have one coyote sightings. So I select that and click next. And now I need to define uh, what the form is going to look like. This is what the citizen is going to see when they open up this app. So I need to make it nice and descriptive. And so we can say coyote sighting reporter or whatever we want to call this. We have a nice little image that we want to use. We can link the URL of that. Um, if you have some real, you know, uh, rich text type of stuff you want to do, you can pick the font, you can pick the colors, the size. The, uh, there's a ton of stuff you can put in here. But basically, you're providing a description to the citizen as to what to do. Um, um, please, please report, report your coyote, coyote sighting here. 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 What are we going to put? Next. Next. At this point, we need to select. All right, we, we have our feature right. class that has all these fields that are in there. Which fields do we want people, people to be able to fill out? And do we need to provide some hints, some hints for the user to be able to, uh, to be able fill this out? So in our case, their fields were name, contact, request, info, and notes. We can change the labels here, make them look a little prettier. Actual real case. Real and then case. instead of request information, of request because that's information kind of because uh, not clear, I can say, uh, clear, I can, uh, say can we uh, contact can we you contact for more you information? For more information. And then uh, maybe and I call then, this comments uh, maybe I call this notes. Comments. So just notes. simple labels just for the text. Labels These other things. options are in here. Do we want to put help text? So if I uh, I mouse so over, it's going to uh, give us some help text. Gonna gonna I can put a hint. So it's like I can put, you know, John Smith would be a, you know, a default answer that would go in that box. And then there's some actually pretty neat things that you can do in here is you can display this text as a text or an email or a URL or things like that. So if you really wanted to customize the look and feel of this form, you can do that. You can do that. Um, and then uh, for the um, label, then, uh, uh, for the, the attachment, label, we can say, uh, please attach, please attach please a photo, attach of, a the photo coyote. of the coyote. All right, and we'll click next. Right, and, and then we're next. really just getting and down to the, the look and feel of the application the at this point. We've got a ton of different themes. And if you pick one of them, like you like cyborg, you can see what that looks like. 
probably a little like intense for a coyote for application, a so we'll pick this one here. So we'll pick a, little this one cleaner here. There. a little cleaner there. Click next, and then we just got a bunch next. of options. Like, do we want to use a smaller header? Do we want to get the ability to share this geoform with other people? Um, you know, just a bunch of stuff in here, but I'll point down at the bottom to select location box. So we're going to give the, the citizen the ability to choose where they saw that coyote. And so the defaults are my current location. Let me click the GPS location. Of where, GPS I am. where I am. It's going to be super uh, powerful be super, here. Uh, I can type powerful in an address, I can type or the other address, default is latitude and longitude, and, longitude and I doubt anybody's going to know the Latin long of their coyote, so let's uncheck that. that. And, uh, and click, next. Uh, click next. It'll preview the It'll application. Preview let's the just application. go ahead and skip let's that skip and go straight to save that application. Publishes it. It's now successfully saved and shared, and this little URL that it creates is just a shortened URL. It's bit.ly. Have you ever heard of bit.ly? Your tiny URL. URL. They take really long URLs, long URLs, URLs tiny little short URLs. URLs. And uh, now that and I've got that, I'll copy, copy it, open it up in a new window, a new window hit go, and this go, is exactly this what exactly the citizen would see in their case when they go to this particular uh, website. Uh, coyote Sightings Reporter, coyote please report your coyote sighting here. Notice I've got my Notice name, got my the, name. The, the default already the default in there, or not a default, but a hint, so John Smith. In this case, if I say I want to be an still, my contact information, amstillindustry.com, can we contact you for more information? So we've got this nice little label here, and because we set this up originally from the database, if we have a pick list, in this case we do, then it automatically knows that. So can we contact you for more information? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, it, and uh, it was on the greenway. Green whatever I want to put in there. Whatever I want to put in there. And then I can say I want to attach a photo of a coyote. So I'm going to click choose file. I've got a picture in here of a coyote. And we'll add that. Add that. Coyote. Coyote. And, uh, <laughs> And then my final option my is, final all right, I need to select right, the location where I saw that coyote. Saw and that this coyote. is where it's this really just, where it's really just uh, heads and tails uh, heads and tail better than the, the, the form that Mecklenburg County was using, is using, is using. Um, because, um, because I don't have I don't to know the address. If I'm on the Greenway, I'm, on the greenway, I'm certainly not going to know the address of this coyote, but I can click the Locate Me button, and it's going to zoom us over to Mecklenburg, that would be my guess. And all right, there we go. So now we've got the coyote sighting. I can pick this up and drag it around or put it wherever I want to put it, which is in the middle of the field. And then... And then, click um, submit entry. Click submit entry. And now it says thank you for and your contribution. So now it knows that now I've knows submitted that this information, submitted to information to the map. If I want to tell my wife about this, or my friends or neighbors or whoever else, and I can share this via Facebook, Twitter, Google+, email, or just you know, text this link over to them, and now we've got a really simple form for sharing this information. Okay, one last little thing. I'd mentioned that this is really more designed for the mobile type of user. If I'm going to be on the Greenway especially, I'm not going to be carrying my laptop. So this this, this, this so form this, is designed this, this to be responsive. Designed to be responsive. And responsive really just responsive means that really just regardless means of what the form factor of your device is, whether device it's an iPad, whether, it's, whether it's a phone, phone whether it's a big screen like this, screen like the, same the same application can be used uh, for, uh, all for all those devices. devices. So if I just take I this, just form, take this form, form and resize it, watch the, the fields and everything, it just automatically shrinks everything down and pushes everything together. And so no matter how small this form gets, it's going to fit the form factor of my device. And so you know that might be the shape of my my phone my here, phone and so it's going to fit everything in here. So I don't have to make a mobile version and a web version, and a web version that, all that all fits nicely. It just automatically resizes this resize for the appropriate phone. The appropriate phone. So, so if you guys wanted to do this, I can go to uh, bit.ly, bit and let's paste and our, let's URL paste in our there. URL in there. And we can make and a custom make form, a custom we'll just call form. this we'll call MCARC, MCARC workshop. workshop. So if you go to bit.ly.com slash MCARC workshop, all lowercase, on whatever on device you have, whatever your device laptop, you have, your mobile phone, whatever you want, this, phone, this, you want, this app has been shared has with... Been shared with um, um, uh, with everyone, and so you're able to open that up with whatever device, and you go ahead and submit some in there if you want to put them on there just so you can see how it works and see how it would look on a mobile device. All right. How are we doing on time? How are we doing on time? Well, we're at a stopping point. So, any questions about this before we take a break for lunch? Before we take a break for lunch?
No. Nope. So if you take a look at the example that I just showed right here, the service itself is actually housing the data can be hosted on ArcGIS and on so there's server requirement for that. The application, when I chose the option to publish it instead of downloading it, that's also hosted on ArcGIS and on so no server required. Um, you can basically do that everything from within ArcGIS and on to do that. Now, once you're done, say it's a project done, level type of thing, once you're done with it and you want to take that data, you can certainly download that download as a file to your database files and distribute that. Distribute that. So where are you? So where are you? So these responses are all going back to Coyote Settings Map. Coyote Settings Map. And if you take a look at this map that we just went into here, where's my button? You should be able to zoom up here and see. There we go. There's the coyote sighting that we put in there before. Um, and if we were to take a look at, this is a service. So the service is hosted on ArcGIS Online. But if we were to go to the details of uh, this particular service, coyote sightings, it's right here. Um, this is all where, where all the data is. But if I wanted to download it. See, oh, I'm sorry. I'm oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right, right, right. This is me being right. signed into that to do that, that, and what I actually need to do is just coyote sightings. Because I can't remember where that is. Remember where that is. So this is a, a feature layer. This is the feature service. And if I were to take a look at the details of this, then we would see, I mean, it's all stored on ArcGIS Online. So whereas a lot of times you're used to working with a file geodatabase or SDE or something like that, that structure simply isn't visible to you uh, from the ArcGIS Online interface. But if I want this data, I can click on the export button, and then I can choose file geodatabase, CSV, or shapefile to get access to that data that you've created. But once you export it, of course, it's going to be a snapshot of that data. How to? Would So, so an email notification was going to require customization, but what Scott just said, we have, and I'll show this a little bit later, is an operations dashboard, which basically takes the web map um, and puts it into kind of an executive type of view of things that will update immediately as soon as a new feature is in there. We can have, it can simply be something that runs, you don't have to touch it, and it'll increment when a new thing comes in there. You can even set it up for an alert, it'll pop up a, a box there. It has to be running, and it has to be something that you can at least look at, but it's not as deep as, oh, I need to go and export to the database and, and look at it that way, and, and it can alert you that a new feature's coming in there. It's just not going to be as detailed as an email or a text message. If, you know, and if it's the public works director that you've created the dashboard for, and that's just one of the apps that sits on his desktop that just runs, and and something pops up on the screen, and he sees that, yeah. 
Right. Right. Yep. You got it. Yep. You got it. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Right. Otherwise, more I questions, think. Otherwise, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, it, yeah it, there's not a way to do a one-to-many one yet, to many uh, yet. Uh, and that's um, probably how you'd eventually how do, you'd it do it once that capability is there, there and it's coming. Um, the, the, other um, the other way would be way instead would be, of having, instead of having I'm, adding I'm adding a new point, point to the map like I just did here, let's have existing points for all of the restaurants and now as the end user I'm clicking on one and adding my comment to it. So you've already you've already defined the points versus allowing somebody to submit their own point. Right, 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 right. Yep. So, yep. So, there would be some data massage, some data massage in order to, to, get in order to, to get to function that way. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The All right. people on the phone, we're taking, a, the phone, quick we're taking a quick lunch break. We'll be back. We'll be back. All right, everybody. We ready to get started again? Ready to get started again? Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. No, we got four hours no, left. I thought, hours we're, left. I thought we were going to. <laughs> I was told I got as I long as I wanted. I know <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're locking the doors. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, let's see. Oh, and that's what we're hoping to provide is yeah. 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 Well, you know, it's well, funny. You know, funny. ArcGIS Online has been out for been out a little over three years three now, years and it's now. obviously and it's been evolving and changing and everything, and but it still hasn't seen a widespread adoption, adoption because it's still because a very it's new, a very thing. new thing. thing. And so, you know, wrapping so your head around how we can do certain things takes some work. And so that's kind of the point of this. Rather than coming in and doing a feature function, here's our mobile collection tool. Here's our tool for this. That's, that's why I at least wanted to put this into a couple of use cases for specific cases departments or functions like that, so you can like kind of apply the technology kind of apply to a technology workflow or something and get you thinking about that. So, all right, cool. All right, cool. Well, thanks. Well, thanks. <coughs> so, we're going to go into go ArcGIS Online for assessors. For assessors. Uh, the idea uh, here is that a lot of assessment operations are. Uh, coming, from coming from a tabular a point of view. Tabular not point granted, of view. Assessors, assessors is just assessors one is location just one that uses tabular, tabular data. When I talk about tabular data, I'm talking about spreadsheets and tables and things like that. Um, and in this case, um, I mentioned this before, but this whole static uh, the static um, workflow, the, the, the static the maps, static, static maps, documents, PDFs, documents, JPEGs, PDFs, things, JPEGs like things, that, things like that are, uh, you know, they're outdated they're from, outdated the, moment from the moment that you, that you uh, hit, uh, hit 
want to say. Export button. The export button. Um, and then from uh, a tabular from standpoint, there's certainly a lot of data out data there that out is in a table, a lot of useful table, information. Of useful information. But, but uh, coming uh, from a coming mapping from point a of view, point uh, obviously uh, being Esri, uh, that's what we focus on, a lot of that information can be better understood when it's applied in a locational fashion. So number one, we want to say no PDFs, no JPEGs. We are in 2014. We can be dynamic. We can share this as a live information service. Rather, service, than rather than an exported data in many, data many different many cases. Different cases. Um, number two, um, number two. We don't have to be tabular in every you know, shape or form. I'm kind of picking on Mecklenburg County, but because it's where I live. So uh, Mecklenburg County, they put on um, the Charlotte Observer has a link into their uh, delinquent tax records. Um, you know, you want to go look up a delinquent tax, uh, you know, a business or an address or a home or something like that. You can go to the site, and if you know the name or the address, you can type it in. You'll get a list of all the ones that match that. Uh, but does it give you any idea? Of as to where that is, unless you just happen to be familiar with that address. And, um, and so what we want to do is we want to take some of that static information, some of that tabular information, and begin putting it uh, into a format that is a little easier to read and it can be live. And so in the case of... Uh, Let's see if it comes up. Palm, Palm Beach up. County. Palm Beach uh, County. Uh, they put together uh, they on their website, on their, website, on their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their newspaper, their news they have an embedded have map an embedded in the middle map of their, of their uh, site, uh, site that shows, uh, that shows uh, I think this is uh, value this change, is value uh, change. In the uh, market in value the change, market yeah. Value change. And so this is an, uh, so this an is interactive an, uh, map, so interactive I can pan around and I can type in my address or my enter name, and I can say, oh, I'm interested in this property in right here. Property right I can here. click on it, and I can see the description. It's a single family. It's had a 36.9% change in market value since 2013. Here's the numbers, and it's just gleaning this information from from uh, the, uh, the database that's there. So I can see there. in 2013 is worth 88,000, and 2014 is worth 121. And so this is an interactive way of viewing information that prior to this was in a table format. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch uh, over to a table and take a look at uh, some of the tools that come with ArcGIS Online uh, that allow you to work with large tabular data sets. Um, but they put it in, uh, put it in a, a format a and a function and a that function will be familiar, will be and, familiar comfortable and comfortable for users who are users who more are apt to use apt Excel. To use so we have a, 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 a product that comes with ArcGIS Online. So just like Collector, if you have an ArcGIS Online username and password, then this is free. There's no additional charge for this. It's called Esri Maps for Office. You install it into uh, Excel and PowerPoint. And what it does is once you've installed it in the ribbon interface, familiar with Excel at all, you're probably pretty familiar with this design, you get a new tab up here at the top that says Esri Maps. And so if you're familiar with uh, Excel, when you click on these tabs, you get a series of buttons that get, allow you to perform the different functions of that tab, whether it's you know a data view or formulas or things like that. But when you get to Esri Maps, the first thing it's going to ask you to do is sign in. And of course, that's going to be your username and password for ArcGIS Online. And once you've done that, you'll begin to use some of the other tools that are here. Now, before I do that, I'm going to kind of explain the data that we're looking at. It's just Mecklenburg County delinquent uh, tax data from from 2011, 2011 I think maybe I think. it's maybe. so it's, it's fairly fairly, fairly old. old yeah fairly 2011 old. yeah, yeah, yeah. 2011. Uh, a couple years old uh, couple but years the basic old. uh premise is, uh, is going to be the same for the for any year's for worth of data it's just tax year number the year owner a uh, property owner, 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 owner their owner, address their information you get over here on the Towards the middle of it, you can see it, that can the see important that information the important is the amount that they're delinquent, the, the amount due. due. And so you can see all of these you values that are in here. <clears throat> And what I'm going to do, there's 59,000 records or something like that in here. Um, that just takes it's a lot of data to work with. We can do it. It just runs slower. So I'm going to do a filter on this and only show me the records that are above $5,000, just to narrow it down a bit. And that'll take it down to 1,083 records, which is much more manageable. And now that I've done that, what I want to do, I've signed in to ArcGIS Online. I'm going to click the Insert Map button. And that's going to insert a live map. Right here, right, in, here in, right here in right here within within our spreadsheet. Within our spreadsheet. So now I can begin, so to, I can begin um, to, um, 
move around the map. Move around and the what map. we want to do next and is we want to add some data to this, data this map. To this now, how do we add now, do we tabular add data tabular to a data map? To well, we, of course, need some type of location-based location information. And there's a couple ways we can do that. If I click the Add Excel data, it's going to take a look at my table here, and it's going to say, well, you've got multiple different ways of representing this data. You can use an address, which I happen to have here. So I could geocode this data from from the address that I have in, in, my I table, have in, in my table uh, to, uh, to use ArcGIS use Online's Arc World Geocoding, geocoding service, so I could use it anywhere in the world. In the world. If you have your you own have your geocoding, geocoding service that you uh, that you, you provide for your area, area then, 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 you then you could certainly use that instead. Um, you could also do it based off of latitude longitude if you have that for your information, U.S. city, state, or zips. Or what I'm going to do is, um, is, um, is show you an alternative you method an alternative of adding data to the map. Adding Say, for example, Say, for I didn't example, have I didn't the have address information, information for each one of these uh, uh, these delinquent uh, taxes, these delinquent but I do but have I do the have parcel the identification, identification number for each one of these. That's a pretty common, a thing, pretty that common thing that I would have that some type of unique identifier for my data set. Now, what? where else would I find a parcel identification number? Well, I would find it in a parcel data set. So I happen to have. Uh, Mecklenburg, County's, uh, Mecklenburg County's uh, parcel, service. Uh, parcel service, and what I'm going to do, I've already registered, already like registered, I showed you before, like showed you with uh, ArcGIS Online. Uh, ArcGIS you click add an you item, you say here's the URL for that service, and I'm going to add it to ArcGIS Online. I've done that, and I'm just going to add a custom locator type. I'm going to click add, and I'm going to search my organization for Mecklenburg Parcels. And we're going to find that Mecklenburg find Parcel Mecklenburg Service. Parcel I'm just going to select it. And so all it's doing is saying, hey, Mecklenburg County has an ArcGIS server. It's got a parcel service with all that information in it, one of those fields being a parcel ID. And here's the layer name. And now it's going to ask me, which columns do I want to make searchable? Uh, in this case, basically, I've got the parcel ID number in my table. I want to be able to match it to the parcel ID field in the service. Well, it happens to be at the top, and so that's PID. And so that's the only one that I care about. That's what I'm going to do my join based off of. I'm going to click Next, and then it's just going to say, give me a name. So we'll just call this Mecklenburg Parcel Locator. Click Add. Add. And now it's added to now my added list to here. My list and so now, and so when, now I to, to when I go to add this table to the map, I'm going to say, I want to use the, map, the Mecklenburg the Parcel Mecklenburg Locator. locator. And it's going to say, all right, we're joining it based off of the PID. In your table, which field is the, the key field there? And so in my case, it's down at the very bottom, and I've got a field called PID. I'm going to select that so those match up, and now I'm going to click the Add button. And so essentially, all this is doing is a join of my table, my data set here, with the parcel service, which has the geometry. Geometry associated with it. So now I'm joining now these I'm two joining things, these things two together. So I'll be able to join my, my delinquent my taxes with the, uh, the parcel uh, the service. Parcel and so you can see it's got 1,083 it's, it's going to attempt to join. I've done 171 at this point. And what I'll do is I'll zoom in here to Mecklenburg County while it's doing that. You'll see the parcels start to show up on the map. Now, while this is going, I'll now show you something else. I can tap on any one of these parcels here on the map, and it'll give me a pop up. Zoom in closer so I can actually click on one. <coughs> Anyone? Anyone? There we, there we go. I tap on one and I'll get a pop-up. So just like on the website side of things, when I click on a, on a feature, I get a pop-up with the information about that. Well, this pop-up is pulling the information from my spreadsheet. So what's pretty cool about this is, all right, let's say, for example, I just took this one at random, and I take a look at some of the information here, and I can see, all right, the total amount due is $9,157.64. Let's say that's my parcel, and I want to change that value. So I'm going to select that row in my data set, select it here. Let's uh, scroll over here to my data values. There it is, 9,157. And let's change that value to $1. There we go. Right? Not so delinquent anymore. All right, well, let's go over to my map again. And, and now you'll notice now that you'll the, notice amount, the due amount due is $1. One so dollar. This, so map this map is dynamically is linked, linked back to my, back to my spreadsheet data. data. So, so as I update my spreadsheet, update my spreadsheet information, information on any field, on any field it's going to automatically, gonna automatically um, <coughs> 
<coughs> update my pop-ups and, pop and everything that I've got there. Another thing you'll notice over on the right side of the screen, it said locations found, it had 999 were successful and 84 had errors. So if you click on the fix errors button in here and you tap on any one of these rows, it'll take you over to it in your data set. And if we were to look at it on the data set, most, case, most likely it's because uh, the, the parcel information is out of date. So either that the parcel number is wrong or I just don't have a matching parcel, so I'd need to go and fix that. If I were doing this as a geocoding uh, service instead of matching it with my parcels, it might be because I've got an invalid address or I've got a typo or something in there. And this basically allows me to click on this, go to that field, make the necessary changes, and as soon as I made the changes and hit enter, it'll attempt to relocate this parcel. And I could do that. I'm not going to do that for 84 different records. I'm not going to do that for any records. I'm just going to be happy with the 999 that I have here and, and move on. All right, so now that I've got all my, or most of my, uh, my delinquent taxes up here on the map, <coughs> The next thing I'm going to do I'm is do I'm going to start I'm taking a look at some of the information that is uh, behind, it. Uh, behind so it. So I know so some of you know in here, maybe all of you in here, have used uh, the, community uh, the community analyst uh, product. Uh, product. And a lot of the and data that is available data in community, community analyst, analyst is also is available through ArcGIS Online in different ways. We don't do the reporting so much because that's kind of one of the functions of community analyst. And I know we're going to talk about that. Actually, Carol's going to do something with community analyst a little bit later today, but you do have some but access have just some based access off of the map to be able to look at some of that data. So say, for example, I click on this particular parcel and there's an infographics button down in the bottom. This automatically takes some of the data uh, that comes from those data from the warehouses that Esri provides and just gleans that information out of, uh, you know, for this particular area. We're looking at parcels, so they are polygons, so we already have a defined area. If we were looking at points instead, what this would be doing would be, would be doing, doing a, a be ring doing or a drive a time area around time that area particular around point so that we could have a, an area to define. But in this case, we're looking at, well, this is an age period, or uh, an age pyramid for uh, that particular parcel. And so I can see what the largest age group is and the smallest age group. I can take a look at the different, uh, Sure, where my data is not showing up there, but I should be able to see tapestry segments. I should be able to see households by income. So if I were interested in what the, the largest group and the smallest group were for households by income for that particular parcel, I'm able to come through here and uh, and pull up this information very quickly. If I was doing some research on that particular area and maybe why we and maybe why we okay. Uh, some some research uh, on a particular some area, maybe why there's a area, large number of large delinquent taxes, taxes there, or, or whatever your project, whatever happens, your project to happens to be. The other thing I can do is while I'm in here is I can select this uh, enrich layer button. So you may have seen this before. Um, <clears throat> this gives you the ability to look at all of the data collection that Esri has, whether it, uh, and, and these are, if you're familiar with the community analyst, you're familiar with these data sets because they're one and the same. Um, but these are everything from global facts, at risk, home data, uh, home value data, household income, household costs, all these different data sets that are in here. And I can pick any one of them. Global facts, for example, and I can begin to look at adding this information to my my delinquent taxes table. So, for example, if I were interested in adding the total population, households, average household size, male and female populations to my spreadsheet, this would create a new column in my table, and it would populate the information for each one of these records as to what the total population is for that parcel or that area or whatever area, it is that I'm, I'm doing for this. And this would, would create that information create from, that information our, from uh, our databases, uh, our databases uh, that, uh, that Esri is providing. So once I've done so that, there's, there's one other thing that we can do while we're in here. Uh, notice the uh, add heat map is grayed out because we're working with polygons and not points. But if we add points in here, a heat map is just a dynamically a dynamically generated uh, heat map. You've probably seen them before. They're bright you know, colors that show you where the concentration of a uh, particular uh, point density is. Um, the other um, option here the is option find hotspots, and that hot is a statistically is a significant, significant hot or cold, cold spot, spot uh, generator uh, for generator your data. For so your data it basically creates basically a, a creates fishnet a over your data over and your finds data and um, data sets, or in this case, our parcels that are significantly, significantly um, 
similar in similar areas to in see is there, uh, see, is there uh, some, type some type of correlation between the delinquent taxes in this case. So if I click on find hotspots and say, oh, let me let me uh, find this hotspot and cold spot clusters based off of the parcel ID, but based off of a particular attribute, we could do that and see if there's some type of correlation there. But ultimately, let's say we've taken this, we've got this, this tabular data set that we've been working with, we've now joined it to our parcels uh, service, so now we know where all of these are on a map. We want to share this information with someone so they can take a look at it. We don't have to, uh, to package this uh, Excel spreadsheet up and send it to them and then get them to install the, the plugin and get them to work with it that way. What I can do is I can uh, actually package this up and put it on ArcGIS Online so people can view it in a browser or wherever they want to see it. And the way I do that is I'm going to click on the Share Map button. And just like you've seen from any other interface, I can give this a name. We'll call this Mac. Delinquent taxes map. Tags, actually I haven't Tags talked about these yet, but you'll see them on pretty much any sharing uh, dialog box. Tags are just search Tags keywords um, so that uh, it makes it easier for people to find particular information. So for example, in the title I typed in MEC delinquent taxes map, but if someone were to do a search for Mecklenburg, for example, or if they were to type in uh, land records, or if they were to type in property, um, um, if I didn't have these tags have here, tags they wouldn't here, find this wouldn't map. Find map. <laughs> it doesn't know that those two things are related. Things are but by putting in these search keywords or things like that, things it makes like it easier for people to locate that, that information. And so that's. If and you're the only one you're working only with this data set, with this it's data probably set. not that big probably of a deal. But when we deal, start talking about doing something like Scott was saying, where we're collaborating, uh, collaborating across different uh, regions, uh, um, and you put some data up there, it kind of helps to have some extra metadata about why you put this up here, what the intended use case was, and these tags, of course, come in later on so that it makes it easier for people to find it. Like, oh, yeah, I just put up this delinquent taxes map, and if somebody goes and searches for property map, they might, not find it. they might not find it. And then the other thing we're going to do is well, we're going to share this with, and so in my case, maybe, so maybe I just share it with the entire share organization. The entire organization at this point. All right. Oh, I got to add a description right. oh, too. So we'll just copy that. Copy that. Put that in there. All right. Then I click next, right. and it's going to ask me, well, what do you want to share as a part of this map that we're creating? So we're creating a web map, which again is the container of all of the different data sources that are in there. Um, in our case, we only have two layers. One is the topographic map, and that's already been shared. It's part of our guides online, so you don't have to uh, to do any sharing there. The other layer is our delinquent taxes layer, and so of course we need to make sure we share it, and it gives you the option to change the name if you want to. And then I'm going to click the share map button. And this is going to take all of this data of that we data have in our spreadsheets, and everything, all of the, the, tax, all information, of the tax information, everything that's here, here, as well as, as, the, as the, the information that we've plotted on our map up here, and any extra stuff that we've put there. And it's packaging all of that up, and it's turning it, it's copying it to ArcGIS Online, and then turning it into a service. And like I said before, turning it into a service is the key piece here, because it at that point becomes something that is interactive within a desktop mobile or mobile uh, or web browser and gives us the ability to interact with this. One other thing that I'll point out while this is finishing up is that let's say I've shared this out as a map and then tomorrow or next month or next year or whatever I want to come back here and I want to update uh, this spreadsheet. Uh, with, new uh, with new records, or I'm changing some of the values, or maybe I'm marking them as paid, or whatever happens to be. Um, what's happened at this point, or what is, is happening at this point, is I'm copying this data to ArcGIS Online, because this is a local data set. What I want to do is I want to be able to update this information. So if I come in here and add 50 new records, or 100 new records, you'll notice now my share map button and share layer button have changed to update shared map. And so what I could do is make my changes, click that. And it's going to synchronize, synchronize my spreadsheet, my spreadsheet with, with the service with that I've just created. Just created. All, right, so All right, so it says map has been shared successfully. Shared so let's go back over to our website, our website and we'll get off of the coyote sightings. And, sightings. and go back to, and my, go back content, to my content where we should be able to find, able to find call it Mecklenburg, right? Let me pay attention to what I call these things. Under the M's, Mecklenburg, delinquent tax map. Um, I need to clean up too. There we go. Mech delinquent, delinquent taxes map. Let's go ahead and open this up in our map viewer. 
we should see the same we map the that we just saw on Excel, and there it is. And now we've got our parcels, we've got we can click parcels, on it, we see all the information that we had in there, and and we've we've now moved out of the Excel realm, and now we've moved into the web realm where we can begin sharing this with whoever needs to see it. Of course, if we're going to put this on our website so that people can find this, one of the first things we want to do is we want to clean up the information that's here because um, if I'm sharing this with the public, for example, instead of our tabular search, this is a lot of weird information that people don't care about. It's got a lot of funky field names in here with underscores and all that stuff. And so we want to change a few things. Um, about these pop-ups. Pop so to do that, I'm going to so locate that, my delinquent tax and layer here in the, here in the um, table of contents. Table of I'm contents. going to configure the pop-up. Pop and by and default, by all default, it shows all is a list of field attributes. Field that's, attributes. That's, that's like an identify that's button like an in, identify in the button desktop in software. The desktop so the software. field name and then the field, field value. And, the field and that's, I mean, that's and that's something I mean, we can come in here and we can toggle some, some of these off so they're hidden. And we could change the, the, the alias so that it looks a little cleaner. But personally, I like changing this to a custom attribute display because what this allows me to do is uh, add some rich text to this, kind of center, the, the, center information the information in the in the pop-up pop box, maybe box, highlight maybe some things or make some things bold so it, it bold looks a little cleaner. Looks a little cleaner. And, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to so center, center, center the text and I'm going to make it bold and I'm just going to add, uh, let's just say we care about the owner name, the address, and the amount due. Those three things ought to work. And then what we're doing at this point is these are just labels. What we want to do is we want to add in the actual field. So if I click on a parcel, I'm going to see that label, and then I want to see the actual owner name. And so if I click on this little plus box over here, I get a list of all my fields that I can glean information from. So I want to add the name of the taxpayer in there. I want to add in under address. We want to add the number of the street plus the street name, and then for a Amount and due, we need to scroll due, down a little bit further little and, further find, and that find that amount due amount field that's in there. In fact, in we, there. Can take fact this we can take this and, and make it make red. It red. Right? So we want people right. to know they owe money. Know they owe money. Right? And then the other right. thing that we're going to do is I want two I want people to be able to link from my my map to the original to tax the original bill. Tax so that tabular so information that, tabular that we talked about is still important. Still Obviously, important. there's Obviously, tons of tabular there's information. There's it's just not very easily easy to look at. Easy to look at. It's not very easy to search for. But we can still but reference it. So I'm just going to say, click here to view your tax bill. What I'm going to do is, I forgot to grab this URL a second ago. So let me do that. I'll go here. All right, so here is so the billing website. The billing website. Right, so this is right, Mecklenburg, so this County's is Mecklenburg County's actual tax actual bill, website. bill website. And you'll notice this and is just a link to all the tax bills for this year and previous years previous and everything else is there. If you look at this look URL at that's up here at the top, top most of it's just, you know, tax bill, Mecklenburg County, NC.us, so on and so forth. But once you get to the end, you can see it's doing a query. It's doing parcel number equals, and then it's got a static parcel ID. We've got that parcel ID because we we pulled it from our tabular data and we pulled it from our parcels. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the first part of this, go over to our map that we're working on, and I'm going to turn this, this text into a hyperlink and paste that URL in here. So now we've got the whole query where it goes up to parcel, uh, parcel number equals, and I'm going to type in the name of our parcel ID uh, field in Curly braces. If you put curly braces, braces anywhere on RGS anywhere online, on it, it, it knows online, that you're referencing a field. Referencing in our case, the parcel ID field was that PID. Field was that PID. And so it's basically doing so it's basically parcel number equals whatever uh, parcel that we're clicking on. So I'll set that. I'll click OK. I'll save this pop up. And so now if we click on any parcel in here, we've got our information, owner name, address, amount due. And then we've got this little hyperlink here. And if I click on it, I should see John Young. And some of these parcel IDs, of these don't, parcel match, IDs so don't match, so I'm going to pick a different one. All right, let's All try right, Hooks Road Investments. Investments. Seriously? Seriously? How many of these do we have? I need, I need, I need to pick one that I know works. Oh, I know that. Yeah, oh, this, know, one yeah works. this one Amir. works. Amir. There we go. There's there we Amir. Go. There's Amir. <coughs> and so this links to it. So obviously, I've got some parcel IDs to clean up. Yep. 
Yep. Yep. You define the pop-up pop in, in the web map, and that propagates, and that propagates to anything else that's referencing that, that web map. So yeah, if you so, created yeah, a basic view or whatever, and you define it there, it'll be there. It'll be there. It'll be there. Yep. So now we, we know so that's working, we, we know at least that's on working, one of them. I one seriously one need to clean up my, my, my parcel ID here. Parcel here. Um, but we've got that working. Um, the other thing that we might want to do here is, um, this is kind of uh, ugly because we're looking at a bunch of parcels on the map, and we don't really need to see the polygon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. Also, we have no idea how much any one of these owe without clicking on it. So what I can do is I can go back to my table of contents. I'm going to click Change Symbol. And instead of looking instead at just the screen polygon, polygon here, here, I'm going to change the symbol to be, to be based off of size, and that size, and that size is going to be based off of, of the amount due. due. So the more they owe, the larger the, larger the symbol. The and so that's going to switch us over to a, a point symbol. A point and instead of using these little circles that are here, I am going to change it to change it a shape. And say, for and example, I, I like this example, orange, like little orange little push pin here. Push pin and I can say, well, the starting can, size, well, the, the smallest, smallest value is 28. Is 20, and I'm going to say that the largest value is 50. Value is 50. All right. And so right. now I'm going to apply so that, apply click, that done. click done. And now we can begin now to can see begin that to see the bigger that the dot, the more the they dot, owe. So more if I click on this one, I can see it's $172,000. And if I click on a small one over here, it is $9,000. And of course, we get a little breakdown of the value ranges here. And we could do this by natural breaks or by any of those. And we could change the number of classes and everything. But at this point, this is just a little easier to see rather than the polygons that are there. And one last thing I want to do this map before I move on is instead of this instead topographic, of this topographic map, map, I want my data to really, want my pop, data to really pop, and so I'm going to change so it to the it light to gray, gray canvas. And I like this, one because, like this one because uh, it still provides still a frame of reference. I can still see them in, in Mecklenburg County. If I zoom in, I can still see uh, the, the roads that are there. But what really stands out are the orange points that you see here on the map. Um, there's other ones that you can do. In fact, uh, like I mentioned before, there's Esri comes out with the imagery and street maps and topographic maps. This light gray base map is one of them. But you can also add you your can own also custom base maps if you built, built one yourself, uh, either through uh, either ArcGIS Online through or an ArcGIS, ArcGIS server. server. Uh, or we can also uh, use other types of base maps. I actually had this one is an open source open base map uh, from Mapbox. Uh, map and this is a dark is gray a base dark map. Gray and uh, that's uh, another option here. Another if you option like the the white text on black background instead of vice versa. There's a bunch of options in here that you can use for your base maps. Um, back points. There we go. Back points. There we go. And actually, I'll do one actually, other thing. This, one is, other this thing. is kind of bugging me. This is kind of bugging so let's go back to let's our. Back to our configure pop-up, pop and, and I'm going to configure these attributes for the amount due. Amount due. If I click on that. If I click on that. Yeah, where'd it go? Yeah, where'd it go? Hmm. hmm. Should be seeing something should over here. Seeing Obviously, something my browser is giving, giving me some issues. What I should be seeing should is, be seeing uh, is uh, the, option uh, the option to add a comma a delimiter. Comma delimiter. So it's a little easier to read that text, but what I can also do is I can come back to my configure pop-up and add in a dollar sign. So now we click on a pop-up. At least know that's a dollar. At least know that's a dollar. But now I've got my map ready. I'm going to go ahead here. I'm going to click save as. Save as. And we'll just call this. We'll just call this tax. Oh, not save as. We already saved as. We should save over that. Save over that. And now we've got our tax map. Now there's several ways that you can begin using this delinquent tax map. Obviously, this is not the end product that you want to give to the public. You don't want people linking to this particular page, this map viewer application, because it's confusing for someone who doesn't have training on it. Um, it's got an add data button. It's got a uh, measure tool, uh, it's measure got tool, it's share got button, and all these things button, like that to create presentation. Like that, create and somebody presentation, just opens this up and looks at some of this stuff. They're going to be like, what are all these buttons? It's not really focused, on what, not focused on what we want to do. And so then and we're so going to go back to the share dialog, and there's really two things that we can do with this. One is, like we saw before, we can make a web application. Say, for example, I just want to create this basic viewer application. I'll just call this basic viewer, save and publish that. And just like the GeoForm, like it gives us a builder kind of, kind of application designer, designer uh, where we can pick and choose uh, the, the, the color scheme and everything. We can change the name. Maybe I like. Maybe I like. Stick with that orange stick theme, with that there. Orange theme there. And. Uh, and uh, 
You seeing orange here? You seeing orange here? Apparently not. Apparently not. All right, whatever. All right, whatever. Orange. Orange. That's really not orange. That's really whatever. Not orange. That's orange enough. Whatever. That's orange so we enough. can pick the color scheme so that we wanted here. We, wanted we can here. also pick can which also tools pick are available. Tools you can see there's a ton can of tools that come up here by default, and maybe we don't care about our public having a bookmarks link or a layer list because we only have one layer. We can take out the measure tool because that shouldn't be important. Map details because it's pretty self-explanatory. So we can pick and choose those things. We can turn off the editor capability. Once we're happy with that, we click the save button, and this interface over here is WYSIWYG. It's what you see is what you get. Wow, that's a hideous color. Wow, that's a hideous color. And, uh, <laughs> What you get. <laughs> and uh, once you're and, happy, uh, with once that, happy with that, then you can, uh, then click, you the can uh, click the done button. And now we've got our application that, our we, application can that we can launch and share with whoever we, we want to see it. All right, so here's the, right, the, end so here's the, the end application. And like I said, the, like the dialog said, the, the or the pop-up box, box that we pop -up define box on the web map the web is what powers what any powers application that is referencing it. So later on, I come down, I come back to my web map, and I decide, you know what, we need a little bit more information here. Let's add a few more fields. We can just update the web map. And all of the applications, all of the we could have five apps have based on that based web map, they will all, all see the same changes, so we don't have to go changes. update all of those. Right. Right. Sure. 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 Is there a preferred web browser? Well, 99% oh, of the time I use Chrome. I'm, 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 the issue with Chrome the issue is, with Chrome is Chrome that Google puts that out Google puts updates whenever they feel like it. And if you look at the, the it's like 30.20.12.15, and it's like a ridiculous number of iterations, and sometimes they break things. Um, I either um, use I either Chrome use or Firefox. IE uh, 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 IE 10 uh, IE and 11 have actually 11 been have pretty been good, pretty but good, I wouldn't use anything I before them because they have issues with scripts and, scripts and sometimes and don't, things don't run correctly or they run very slow. They run very slow. So either use IE 10, so 10 or IE higher or higher Chrome or Firefox. Chrome or Firefox. Um, and then just um, the caveat with Chrome is they update when they feel like it. Sometimes they break. Sometimes they break. Um, the other thing I was going to show you is that in addition, in addition to being able to being create a, a um, standalone stand web application web like we just did with the basic viewer, viewer, is maybe we want to take this map that we have here and just embed it in, embed in an existing in an site so that they don't have so to go to another link to open that up. And so we can do that by clicking on the share button. We need to make sure we share that with everyone. It's got to be public in order to embed it into a public website. Website. And once we've done that, we've we can done click that, the Embed in embed Website in button. Website and this button. Generates, generates the HTML code, the HTML for, us code for us to have an iframe, basically a window in your web page that contains this map. And we can define a few things, like how large we want this to be, small, medium, large, or custom size. We can say, oh, I want to zoom control and a home button and the location search. And that automatically updates this HTML code for us. What's pretty cool about this is in a lot of cases, the people building the, people maps, building the maps are different, are different than the people, than the people who, are who are maintaining the website. So the I know how to build a map. I know how, how to get this data and turn it into this map, but, but I have no control over the web, uh, website, website or the website, website design. design. And this and kind of this makes it so that I can build the map, build copy the map, this, copy email it to the webmaster, and say, hey, can you put it on this page, please? And so all I'm going to do is copy this, and then we're going to do Mecklenburg County Property. Assessor, like that. Let's see what the web page is. Assessor's office. There we go. So let's say this is, this is Mecklenburg County's assessor's office page, and let's say we want the delinquent taxes map that we've just created to be front and center, right in the middle of this website, as it should be. As it should be. <laughs> but I, I am. But I am. I am. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is, so I, I, obviously, is I'm not obviously hacking I'm not their hacking web page. Their it's web page. a little bit more involved than that, I'm sure. That I'm sure. Uh, but within my browser, within my browser I'm, going I'm going to change this. And, um, and I'm going uh, to I'm going insert to my map. Insert Remember, my I, just map. Remember I just copied the code from ArcGIS Online. I'm just pasting it in there. And 
and I'm click the I'm click close the button on this. Close button on and this. what this does is now it's placed this iframe in the middle of the page. And now we've got an interactive got an map interactive that we can zoom in on. We can click on the points and we see our links and we can link to the the tax bills. I know people love that. I know people love that, but it's there. So, yeah, so yeah. it'll be gone now. So but, be gone uh, now but yeah, so this is yeah. a powerful way of doing this, and, and doing this is kind of something we see on a regular basis is, is static, static images, images on web pages or, page, or a PDF, a PDF that someone has someone exported, exported and then put a link to that you, link you click on you click on up. up. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be a direct link to the data. It can be interactive. You can customize this. So like I said, with the basic viewer, this works the same way. Later on down the road, I go back to my web map and I decide I need to add a few more fields to this. I can do that on the web map side of things. And then when I save then it, when I save this it, will automatically this will update on the web page, and I'll see, see those fields show, show up in here. Show up in here. So, so for the benefit of the people on the, the phone, the question the was, if you choose if you something choose like the legend and, like and, uh, and you have that in, uh, in this embedded, embedded map, embedded uh, by map. default, it'll uh, just default, put a button up here at the top that says legend, and people legend, actually have to click it to get the legend to show. Can you do that automatically? Yes, you can. It's just a tag that goes into the HTML that says auto-enabled equals true. It's something similar to that. I can find, there's a in the help, there's a list of commands. It's not, gonna it's not up, something that's going to show up uh, here. Uh, you, you know, show legend you know, will be there, but, be it, doesn't there, but it doesn't automatically uh, display that. Uh, but there is there a there list is in the help document that show that some show extra tags that are in there to make things things pop up automatically, pop up automatically. Or, or even to resize even to the, that legend because that it's got a default size width that it shows up, and you might want it to be wider or narrower. So there's some sample stuff in the help documentation. So, so all right, all right. did we cover did everything? We cover everything? Oh, oh, I wanted to show you one other piece of this. All right, so I just embedded, right, so I just embedded a, a single map single into map the middle of a web page. Of a web page. But let's say, but for example, and this is kind of going out of the, the realm of, of, of where we've been with the assessor stuff, but in terms of the technology, let's say I had a gallery of applications. I had a bunch of different apps that are designed for the public to be able to view. For example, I've got this group here called Public Map Gallery. And you can see there's after school programs, art in public places, city marinas, daycare centers, just individual maps that that would be for public consumption. And rather than having, here's an embedded map, here's an embedded map, here's an embedded map, or a bunch of links to each one of these, we can make a gallery out of these that show us thumbnails, thumbnails and give people and give the ability to go to one place to, to, one place find, to these. find these. Um, and this can, um, and all, this be can all be organized via a group. Via a so group. I just take so all, just all of my maps that, that I want to organize, organize, organize together. together. I put them in a group. Them in a group. What groups are for. And once I've done that, done I, that, I can click on the share button up here for the group. Instead of the individual map, I'm doing it for the group. And just and like just I had like before, I, had before I, can make, I can make I can embed, I can this, embed in this in a website, or I can make a gallery make a application. Gallery application. The gallery, gallery application gives me a standalone gallery, gallery where I, I, have, where all I, I have all these thumbnails. Or if I just or want to put it right in the middle of the web page, just like I did for the map, I can copy that code. I'll come back over here and I'll show you. If I refresh the page, see it's gone. It's not real. Uh, but I can uh, come in I here and I can, and I can embed that code embed for the gallery. The gallery. And apologies, and apologies for, what for what it looks like. It's probably like going to overlap some overlap stuff because I didn't size, size it properly. Size but, it properly. But, but when I paste that code in there for the gallery, Actually, it looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Uh, we uh, have we all have of the thumbnails, all the thumbnails for, those for those individual, individual uh, maps that are as a part of my group. And so if I mouse so over I mouse any one of these, I'm going to see the summary of the, you know, what is this map about. If I click on view map, it's going to open up a an embedded map right here. I guess on my images are broken, but I've got an interactive map. And when I'm ready to go back, I click the X button. I can launch any one of these maps here. What's really neat about this is if I come back to this gallery, 
any point in the future, and maybe I've added a few new maps to my gallery. When I add them here, they automatically show up here when somebody goes back to the site. So I can manage the content of this page, paste the code in one time, and then all of my management comes down to the individual group. So there's a lot of really cool ways that you can get interactive maps into your websites. It can be a standalone application, or it can be um, an embedded map or an embedded gallery. All right, so, All right, so what time do I go to? What time do I one? go to? Is it one? Okay. Okay. All right, so right. we've done so that one already. That one what already. I want what to take, want a, look to take a look at is ArcGIS and Line 4 Police. Well, maybe not these police, well, maybe but, not these police. but um, I, I, I've, since I, I've already spent I've a lot of time, time building some time web maps and showing, and showing you how those look, I wanted to show you some of the ways that you can take some of this information and begin to share it in different ways. So we just showed you sharing information as an embedded map. We showed you sharing some information via a standalone web application. But one of the ways you can share this information on a more internal type of basis is to use what we call the operations dashboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch gears again. The operations dashboard, just like the Ezra Maps for Ops plugin, just like the uh, the collector application, is another standalone application that is included as a part of ArcGIS Online. So no additional cost. All you need is your username and password. And what you do is you uh, you can just go to ArcGIS Online and do a search for operations dashboard, and you'll find it. And you'll find it. And when you uh, it's an installation for. Uh, the, builder uh, the builder application is an installation. Is an installation. Uh, once you've built uh, once you've an, built operations, an view, operations view, then you can save it, can and that can be viewed in a web browser. In a web browser. So the idea here, since so we're, idea talking here, about, we're talking uh, about uh, police, is uh, let's is, take a look uh, at a, a pre-built pre operations, operations dashboard, dashboard that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, might you know, be used for might be a CompStat type, type of uh, situation, uh, situation, an emergency operations, operations center. center. Um, it could be um, uh, kind of like what we talked about like before talked with about the before uh, with having the, uh, a... Having um, a um, an alert type an functionality. Alert type we really just want to see how public works. They missed a trash pickup or something like that. You know, I just want to see an all-in-one location that I can go and see a map. I can see a summary of the information. Maybe not. Maybe not. Close that and try reopening. Close that and try reopening. Um, I can go to a uh, one-stop shop to, a to one see all of that information. And let me, and let me try that again. Try that again. Well, that was short and sweet, wasn't well, that was it? Short and sweet, Let's wasn't try it? a different Let's one. Let's try. Maybe it won't be about the police. Maybe it won't be about the police. Let's take a look at. Let's take a look at the special event planning dashboard. Special event planning dashboard. Do I have internet here? Maybe not. Do I have internet here? Maybe not. Should. Should. Maybe I lost my internet. Maybe I lost my internet. Well, Wikipedia is working. Well, Wikipedia is working. <laughs> All right, Ezra.com right, is working. Ezra. Oh, there it is. All there right, it is. let me All try right. one more time. Let me try one more time. Maybe it's set a heck up on my internet. <clears throat> Nope, it just hates me. Nope, it just hates so me. let's go yeah, back to go my special event planning operations, operations dashboard, and, dashboard and, we'll and we'll just take a look at kind of how this is designed to work. Um, the idea here is, the that, idea we is that we have widgets. Widgets are just a, are just a fancy, fancy name of saying individual tools, individual tools that provide a specific function. Uh, in one hand, uh, we've got the large widget in the middle, which you know as a map. And in this case, we're just looking at a special event planning area. So say we're going to have a parade or a festival or a marathon or something like that. That's occurring, like that's occurring in the area. That's what the data, that's set, what is the data set is looking at. We want at. to provide want to information, information about what's going about on what's going in this particular, in this particular area. area. So, of course, so a map is going to be important so we can see important. the overall so information the overall about that, information where about things that, like first aid are, like first aid um, are um, you know, restrooms, uh, you know, street restrooms, closures, things like that. 
The other widgets that the you see over here on the left side of the screen are ones that are one can be a list, they can be a bar chart or a pie chart, they can be a summary, they can be an indicator, they can be all sorts of different things that are based off of your data that allow you to glean information and display it in an easier way to read. So for example, for the special event asset, I can see that there are two road closures and for the assets and things that have been deployed, there's two road closures of the restroom and information kiosk. Uh, security, security uh, checkpoint security and first checkpoint aid station. And, first aid and these are just and these are looking just at the data, and as I add new data to SNAP, these are automatically going to update in real time. Same thing about recently thing deployed about assets. Deployed this is just a list of the most recently most deployed ones that's ordered by the, the time that they were deployed. If I want to find out more information about it, I can click on this first aid station, for example, because nobody enabled that. I'll show you that in a second. And then the other thing is, oh, this is just a assets response responsible by, by agency. By so agency. Four of these assets were put out by the CMPD, one by Carolina's Healthcare, and the other one doesn't have about it. So the way I set this particular dashboard up is when I start editing this, I can come in here and say, all right, these recently deployed assets, let's configure this. And all we're doing is we're pointing at a certain data source. In this case, it's the web map, and I'm looking at my special events point layer that's on the map. And then I'm sorting this based off of the time that it was set up, the order I want to sort it, sending or descending, how many records I want to see, what I want to show in my preview so I get to choose what I want to show the code, so first aid, road closure, security checkpoint, whatever happens to be. And then underneath that, I'm putting the time that it was set up. I'm really just defining what I want this dashboard, want to, look this dashboard like. to look like. And then the feature, then the feature actions is actions what happens if I click on one, one of these particular these features particular in my list of here. So that's what here. nothing that's is what enabled right now. But maybe if I do a single if I if I do a single click, I want the option to highlight it, pan to it, or zoom to it. And if I double click on it, I want to show the pop up. It doesn't have to be it's difficult to set this up. And so now you'll see that when I right click on here, I see I can highlight this on the map, so it highlights it for me, or I can pan to it or zoom to it. If I double click on it, then it's going to show me the pop up with the information about that. So this dashboard can be used in a way to, to glean a lot of information. I can also set up filters on this. So, hey, only show me the assets that are owned by uh, the police, or only show me the assets that are owned by EMS, or so on and so forth. I can put a uh, timestamp. So I can say, show me everything, say, show me that, everything was that was deployed within the last 24, within the last 24 hours. hours. Um, this could be used um, as, be used a, as a, a damage assessment damage type of assessment dashboard. Type of so dashboard. an emergency so situation, you've got an emergency you operations emergency center, operation this sits center. up on the wall, this so I can see wall, how many can assessments have been done, what's the total assessed damage amount. You know, where, so obviously, where, obviously where are these assessments, are assessments are taking place, which crews place, are which out there, are out there. Um, what um, type what of type damage are we seeing? Moderate, we seeing? moderate, severe, severe, severe completely destroyed, destroyed, minor, minor no minor, damage, that no type damage, of thing. So we can set up so a ton of these widgets of these that allow me to allow me uh, cycle through uh, this information. And because you can and set this up to essentially refresh um, at any interval that you want, you could have a refresh every five refresh seconds every five if you wanted seconds. to, and that, way, and that uh, way you would immediately uh, you see, would immediately an, see uh, an, uh, an item that appears uh, on the map. So, so in the case of the like the, like the, the, the trash the pickup the service, trash in this service, case, in this it would be, it would if be, I'm a director and, director and I've got this sitting got on my sitting my, my second my monitor or second wherever it happens to be, I'm going to see this information. If one pops up on the one map, I either see map, it here, I see it listed at the top of my list here, or you can even set some of these up to have an alert where it pops up a dialog box in the middle of the screen and says a new feature was added or it's reached this threshold or any number of, of different things. It's all coming from your, your data. I want to try one more time with try one more time. It's really annoying me. That's not working. That's not working. All right. So Atlanta Police Dashboard. There we go. See, how hard was that? See, how hard was that? So, <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is Atlanta. This, this is, is their uh, crime, crime data. I can't remember for what time period. But uh, again, but, this is just uh, again, a summary by crime summary type. By so, crime type. This, so most of the crimes were larcenies for 29 of those, and so on and so, and so forth down the list. Summaries by zoom. So for you know in a police department, if they're doing a comp stat, they're trying to get an idea of just what's been going on on a day-to-day basis. I can see. 
where these crimes are based off of zone, based off of crime type, based off of day of week, by shift. And you can have as many of these widgets on here as you want. They simply just give you multiple pages of them. And so in this case, this was like, oh, maybe these are repeat offenders, the top 10 addresses. So 3393 Peachtree Street has six offenders. I think that's kind of funny because everything in Atlanta is called Peachtree Street. So like, how do you how do you know which one's which? But if we zoom to, pan to, where is it? It's not my day for this. Not my day for this. <laughs> That's one way to view it. <laughs> or we can come over here and we can come query by beat. So maybe I just want to know, hey, how is beat 103 doing? Uh, 103 I come in here and I type in beat 103, I hit execute, and it's going to query that particular beat. Uh, okay, obviously this is having issues. This, this, this is my server is my running server back in Charlotte, back in Charlotte hosting, hosting this data, so it's data, obviously so having some issues right some now because that query because usually that happens instantly. Usually happens and we'd just be able to see all the crimes that occurred in that beat, and then a list of those crimes, and we'd be able to access it. Or we could simply click on one and get information about it. And you can even link to the bird's eye view, for example. This is just posting in the latitude and longitude into the Bing bird's eye view. Being difficult, being difficult with me. Put in the coordinates. In the Usually coordinates. it'll zoom me into that location and show you the bird's eye view. Apparently, apparently, not the one's not the one to do it. So, we will move we'll along, move but along, what I wanted to what finish, up finish up with is this dashboard, this dashboard the download is installed, installed onto, your onto your desktop. That's going to be installed for someone who is going to be building this view. So, in this case, this is the Atlanta Police Operations Dashboard View. When I click the Save button, that's what it was named as. That view is simply an item in ArcGIS Online, which can then be opened either here on this installed dashboard, or I can come back to my groups. And let's go down here to Law Enforcement. I think it's at the bottom. At the bottom. Yep, Atlanta Police, Atlanta Police Operations Dashboard. Operations so let's dashboard. open that up, open and, that this up. and this will launch it in my browser. And we'll see the same we'll exact the view same that we saw on the desktop side of things. You just see it in the browser window. Browser window. Or not, if it doesn't or want to work. work. But that means it'll also open up on something like an iPad or a tablet. It's not going to open up on a phone. There's just simply not enough real estate to get all of that information on the form factor for a phone. But with your web browser, you'd be able to open it up I apologize, I'm not sure why this I'm is having sure issues, but I think you get the point. It looks exactly the same, it's just in a web browser. All right, so um, to, to wrap um, up, we're kind of running out of, kind of running out of time here. Out of time here. Um, so I, I know so that this I, was going to be a question, because it's always a question. But what about the credits? What about the credits? You, know, you know, people hear a lot of all these credits, and you feel like you've been, you might have picked the wrong day to quit sniffing glue. So I want to cover credits. Uh, because people uh, hear because credits people hear and, credit, whoa, what is credit, whoa, what is credit, and how much does a credit cost, and what can I do with the credit, and why are there credits, and all that type of stuff. And, that and so I want to tell you what credits are, credits are used for. Are used for. Um, I want to tell um, you how you can um, address the whole credit situation, and then how you can kind of view how credits have been used. So number one, credits are included as a part of ArcGIS Online. There's a certain number that comes with it. I don't know. I don't know. 10,000 for, 10, the, for, for the, 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 the organization the, the that NJRs can purchase. And then from a usage standpoint, how why do you have credits? What do you use credits for? And I think the easiest way to kind of point that out, and if we go just to the ArcGIS Online page, you can see, well, what uses service credits? And there's obviously a lot of things that are in here that potentially can use credits. For you guys, Anybody using community Anybody analyst using community analysts, um, are, are going to be um, using be credits when using you generate a report. Generate so, a report. As so as you can see here, 10 credits for a report. Credits well, a credit is well, worth 10, 10 cents. So 10 credits so is a dollar. dollar. So that's, that's, so that's kind of that's the breakdown the for breakdown a report. For Anytime a you create a report, it's going to cost you 10 credits. It's going to cost a dollar. Um, when it comes um, when to it comes other uses other or uses outside of community analysts, but what are some of the main uses that we see people using credits? 
or by far or the by far largest the credit, largest credit consumption, consumption um, has been uh, based has off been of geocoding. Geo so, so if you use so Esri's you use World Esri's Geocoding, geocoding service, service and you type and you in type an address, an like, address hey, like, hey, zoom in to this address, it doesn't cost you any credit. So it's a single address. We don't care about that. When it costs credits is when you do batch geocoding. You know, you've got a thousand addresses and you want to pull them on the map. That uses credits if you use uh, Esri's geocoding service. If you have your own geocoder, uh, like on ArcGIS server, for example, then that doesn't use any credits at all. That's just you're using your own architecture, so there's no credit cost for that. That's by That's far the by largest, far the credit, largest credit consumer. So you can see it's 40 credits per thousand geocodes. Uh, but uh, if you're so if you're not using that, uh, if you're using your own, then there's no credit cost. Otherwise, that's what it is. Uh, the other kind of main user of credits is for hosting your data on ArcGIS Online. So if you're not going to be using ArcGIS Server to create a service, and and you're instead going to use Esri's infrastructure to do that, then it falls under this little line item right line here, item feature right services here, storage, feature and that's 2.4 credits, credits, so 24 cents, 24 cents per 10 megabytes per, 10 megabyte per month. So what does that so mean? Does because that mean? that's because several pers in there and everything. There and everything. But, um, but um, 24 cents per 10 megabytes. How much is 10 megabytes? <sighs> Uh, well, it's generally two MP3s, but I don't think anybody's storing those on there. So uh, we're talking about point lines or polygon data, which is really what we're talking about here. It's a lot of, of, of data. Most data sets don't uh, eclipse that outside of imagery, which we're not talking about. Most data sets are going to be smaller than 10 megabytes. But let's say at a 10 megabyte data set, it's going to cost you 24 cents per month to host that on ArcGIS Online. End of story. It doesn't matter how many people access it. It doesn't matter. If you, if you download it 5,000 times, 5, times uh, there's no charge uh, there's for no bandwidth, charge for there's bandwidth, no charge there's for, no charge for um, you know, the number of connections number of or anything like that. It's flat based off of the amount stored for how long. For how long. Um, so, um, for example, so the, uh, the delinquent, the delinquent um, let's um, take a look at that real quick. The, um, the, um, where is it? Let's go back, go back to, to my content. My content. We'll, just we'll just verify, verify this. this. Um, delinquent, taxes. delinquent taxes, there's my there's service. If we service. click on that service, so I took that so whole, took that whole uh, spreadsheet, uh, spreadsheet and I and uploaded it to ArcGIS Online and turned it into a service. Into a service. Um, well, right um, now this well, says right that the size is one is kilobyte. Well, one kilobyte is a thousandth of a megabyte, and then megabyte is a tenth of the 10 megabytes per, it's, it's minuscule is minuscule. what that gets down to. So for the most part, even though that's one of the larger one user, of the larger users of uh, credits, uh, uh, that's, not that's not typically not an issue been for an issue. For uh, storage, uh, storage. Uh, for, 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 uh, for, credit for, for for credit There's other ones in here. You can certainly go through, go through here and take a look at it. But what, what I wanted to cover here, here is make sure that we talk sure about talk about kind of our recommendations. Kind of our recommendations. Number, one, Number one. Does everybody, does everybody, everybody need, need to be able to, be able to, use, able credits? to use credits? Maybe. I don't Maybe. know. I don't really know. don't know really for, don't know for how, how this organization, organization is set up. Is set up. Um, maybe you um, do, maybe you, do, maybe you don't. Maybe you have a few maybe people who, who uh, are really just going really to be viewers, and, 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 they're, and not they're not going to need to use any credits. Any credits. So the easiest the thing, thing to do is to create, create a, custom a custom role, and, and that, basically that basically eliminates their ability to spend credits. So as any administrator in ArcGIS Online can do, they can come to my organization and go to the settings, and we have this thing called thing roles, called and by default, roles. we have users, default we have users, publishers, and administrators. Those administrators. are built in, they're always there. They're always but you can create your own create role. And, uh, and uh, you can base it off, can base it off a template, but you can always change, you can change this. this. You can see all these checkboxes check that, that are in here that let you pick and choose what each person can do, and to a pretty fine-grained fine level. level. So if I come in so here and I just want to create a viewer role, and all I want them to be able to do is view existing content, I don't want them to be able to create any new content, and I don't want them to be able to spend any credits by accident, you'll notice these checkboxes here, the ability to geocode, enrich data, all that type of stuff, they're unchecked. And the ability to publish, ability to data, publish sets, data sets, those are unchecked. Are unchecked. This, person this person would be unable to spend unable credits to spend at all. At all. So that would be the first thing so is, the first if you had some people within the, within the organization, or if you're using your own uh, ArcGIS uh, Online users online that, you users that you get with your desktops, um, that, would um, that would be the first thing to do is identify the users who need, users need to be able to use credits potentially. And set those.
Ten thousand credits is ten thousand credits is a thousand dollars, yeah. And 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 what and what do you know when the you know they're renewed? Renew? Okay. So you okay. so okay. since so September sixteenth, since September sixteenth you've spent almost seven hundred credits. Almost seven hundred credits. Basically what it is. Since September seventeenth or sixteenth, whatever it is, of next year that would that would pop back up to ten thousand back up to ten thousand renew ArcGIS online you would it's it's basically it's ten thousand for the year. At any time, you can add credits in blocks of a thousand, so over a hundred bucks. Yeah, so that's a good point. So the first thing is find who needs to be able to use credits, create a custom role for them, and assign that. Oh, sorry, I go back to that. So go to my organization. You have to be an administrator to do this. But you click on my organization. You click on edit settings, and then there's a roles tab over here. And you just create, a new, create role. a new role. So you define, you define who can spend, who can those, spend credits, those credits. And then once you so define once you that, you go and talk to those people who are able to spend credits and you give them training and, training and say, and look, look, you, have, you the have the ability to spend credits. Spend credits. This, is spend credits. Credits spend credits. this is how credits get spent. And so you need and to be aware of, all right, well, geo-enriching data. And we have 10,000 variables. And you have 50,000 record table. You don't need to go and just add every single variable to your 50,000 record table because you think it's cool to do that. Uh, there's some training that goes there. You wouldn't hand keys to your 15-year-old kid and say, I just take off. You'll figure it out on your own. Same thing goes for the credits. It, basic training is kind of something that you would just say, hey, this is how credits get spent. And this is what you, you know, how you might want to uh, you know, take a look at that. And then to your question, the ability to um, monitor credits, there's two ways of doing that. Let me uh, show you the first one. The simplest way of just looking overall at credits is underneath that organization. I can click view status. And I can just see my total amount, see amount of credits remaining. I can see how many I, I spent many in the last 30 days or the you know, last seven days or 24 seven hours or whatever, whatever or time period I want to do. And I can see how those have been used on a functional basis. So I can see that uh, you know network analysis did 22 routes. It cost me seven credits. And I can see that. That's from the functional analysis. The other thing that I can do is I can go to the Esri Marketplace marketplace.archis.com and download. There's a free app. It's, it's by uh, Esri. We created it. I don't know why we haven't included it as a part of uh, um, ArcGIS Online yet. But if you just go and search for activity dashboard, you'll find this little um, download, essentially. It's not even a download. It's just a plug-in. And you say, oh, OK, this is what I want. And I want to, uh, as an administrator, you need to do this. You can say, all right, I want to add this application to my organization. It's going to ask you to sign in as your administrator, and you will approve it for the organization. Once you've done that, you'll just have this a part of the org. It doesn't cost anything. It's just something you have to add. You have to opt into. And once you've done that, you get this portal where you're able to where you're able to you're view, able to activity, view activity reports for the past for the up past, the past three months. Past three months. You can do analytics you usage analytics to see how many credits remaining, how many uh, uh, credits were used this period, and then you can go over to a per user basis. And so you can see the top users, credit users. You can see individual. You can see me here. The contributions for the past however many days you want to do that. You can see where that person's been using those credits and even down to the, oh, have been adding these items in and where those things are. So that's a way you can monitor that credit usage per uh, individual within that organization. That's a really good question. I'm not entirely sure that is. It might be a user, be that, a user that, got that got deleted and is no longer, and within, is the no longer within the organization. I, I'm, that's a guess. I, I'm, that's a guess. Um, yeah. um, let's see. Let's see. Just lost audio. Just lost audio. Oh, oh OK. OK. So, so uh, th that's basically, uh, that's basically the, 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 the the main thing about the, the, credits, about the credits is, is you, you need to know what they're used for. You can find that on the ArcGIS online site to kind of see the, 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 the potential ways the credits, credits could be spent. 
Um, once um, you've once determined you that these are potential ways, potential ways to the dashboard, the dashboard, I, I don't know. It don't might work on an iPad. Work I've never actually tried it. It certainly is not going to work on a phone. On a, on a uh, phone. Uh, I know it won't work uh, here, but it might work on an iPad. But yeah. But yeah, know what the credits are for, define who can use who them, can provide, use training, to provide training to those people who are people going to be using, are going them, to be using and then and for monitoring the purposes, purposes, the activity dashboard, the activity dashboard free plugin for, free plug -in for our plug -in online that an administrator can use to sort use this to out and determine out who's determine used, who's those credits. used those credits. Great. Great. So we are. So we are. I want to make sure I can charge the back. Sure. So okay, so, just real okay, quick. Just real quick. I'm done. I'm done. So and I know we're so, like know pretty we're much at the end of my time anyway. So anyway. I'm happy to so answer I'm any questions. Answer any but questions but just so you know, just so I'm, you know I'm, I'm pretty much done with mine. So we have questions. Right, right, right. So there's, right. there's so basically there's two ways to link to, to uh, like a photo, uh, like for, a example. Photo, for example. One is you attach it as a part of the, the, the database, so it becomes a feature, so a feature attachment in the database. In the database. And, and two is to just be a hyperlink to, to a web server, for a web example, server, that, that's hosting that's those files. Hosting so it would be like, so be you know, like, myserver.com slash file name or whatever it is. That's one way. Click on it, it opens up your hyperlink. The other way is how I showed it with like the... The taking a picture and linking it that way, and that's part, that of, the and that's part of the itself. database itself. And one's free and one's free. Right. Right. Hyperlinks, no credits. Hyperlinks, no credits. Putting it in the database is give credit. The only time it would be the only time in, it would be uh, credit, in, uh, credit in the database, in the database, database is if you're hosting, if you're that, hosting, that, on hosting that on ArcGIS online. If you're, hosting that on ArcGIS if you're using your own ArcGIS, you're ArcGIS, ArcGIS server, there's no... There's no... Really, the credit could have used as a general rule of thumb, if you're, thumb, if you're using ArcGIS online, ArcGIS online to host, host the, data the data or, or do or the work for you, the work for then, you then, then that's what's going to cost credit. If you're using your own your architecture, own infrastructure, architecture infrastructure, then there's not then a credit cost for it. Not a credit cost for it. Sure. Yeah, sure. you can use whatever yeah, you want. You we have our defaults, but then, default, then, then you can you can you link can, your you own. Can link your own. I don't think so. Think so. Not, at this moment. Not at this moment. I, I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can. Um, I, don't, I don't think we've. I don't think we've. we've, we've it's just not in the interface to do that right now. Do that right now. <laughs> I think so. If you if you wanted so. to have it rotated, that, have way, it rotated yeah. that way, yeah. At least at this point. At least at this point. All right. All right. We good? 
We good? Licensing is supposed to be a named user. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're not tracking. <laughs> 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 Y'all ready to move forward? Um, I'm glad you stayed here late this afternoon uh, to cover the migratory mating concepts of the shrub and quail. Um, we have a lot of data compiled. <laughs> just, just kidding. I had, had to get a little humor in there. Um, for this five or ten minutes, all I want to do is just show you some practical applications that we almost or kind of have going with some of our local governments. And this one here is just a, a simple utility editing application. The plan is, is that the local government 
it kind of replaces their hard copy map books that they've got out in the field and they can they can take this out with them uh, Claremont actually has Wi-Fi they can get to so you know connecting and getting it live is not an issue for them you know we've got guys that are used to using shovels not not iPads and stuff so there's a little bit of a curve coming in on us them using that technology but really this is um, you know just hard hard deadpan straight into ArcGIS online and it connects back the layers for the most part are within our Arc server and coming out um, we initially mapped them a couple of years ago and so keeping your fingers crossed and a little while ago it wasn't working but you know we can come in closer and you know as you see the features yeah, and you've got your typical util utility water sewer this that the other you know, click on a feature you get some information here and then you notice right here hey guess what I can edit that and so it'll pop up you know just a nice little form it's based on our domains and stuff that exist or you know pick lists and this and that and the other and so we can make those edits and changes and they're kind of pretty live and go back now this is just a test database this isn't their live data and <clears throat> one thing this does is you know any any tool, your phone or your, which you probably wouldn't want to do unless it's one of those bigger ones, or your, your laptop or your tablet, no matter what flavor, you know, through the web browser and all, this kind of gets past the data collector issues. And again, this is all, this is before data collector came out that we put this together. So it gives you editing capabilities that you can do out in the field. And, um, you know, if you integrate, if you integrate and go with the, um, the GPS on board your device, you know, you can get to rec grade. You know, these are all mapping grade, probably subfoot. So that's not going to be good enough. So, you know, if we want to go and have people collecting new stuff with their iPads or whatever, we've got to get an external GPS that gives us the quality that we want. Um, you know, or use like a, if they have an existing, like one local government has a GOXH or an XT, we can Bluetooth that in and get our XY coordinate from that and use it either, you know, real time or, um, some other technology to get that down to, you know, mapping grade and use those points and, you know, that's one little application. I don't know if you have any questions about it, but I wanted to show and share that that's a way you could use this and help your local governments. Um, another topic I just wanted to go over really quickly, let's see, How many of y'all have looked out here at our NC Regents website to see this really cool interactive map we've got? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm clicking here, I'm not getting crap. I mean, I'd like to see us have something more interactive. And we've tried to get there working with Betty, and they've got a, a gal that's their web developer, and somewhere we've got a hidden page that's for the NCARC, but I don't even know how to get to it. The, okay. Okay, so we could get to it. We can get to it, but you know, thinking about ArcGIS Online and how we might could do something different. Um, here's an example. Well, if I can type, I'll show you an example. Um, our GIS tech, Todd Stroop back there, he's kind of the new meeting office, so we throw stuff at him. But he's been playing around a little bit with this template, and it's you know, very incomplete, but yet it brings you an idea of something, you know, what if we could go to something more like this, you know, and as you, um, you know, you look here, here's all of our regions, there how you get some information. You know, as we get the programming down more, you can click and go in or say, you know, here's region A. Boom, it jumps in there. We get a little bit better idea. Uh, one tool that we've looked at doing is down around here, you can add, it's probably doing cascading style sheets, but you could have custom maps that would have, like we talked about, you know, demographics or, or this, that, the other, what have you, and be able to come in now and have this access and be kind of the front porch for the NCARC to come in. Then you think of other apps, like we were talking about NC Tomorrow or this or that or the other, is you start having the opportunity to pitch some things statewide or multi-region or dual region. You've got an interface already built that's there. And um, I don't know. Right.
Anyway, just some ideas. Any questions? Yeah. This this is a story map. There are different types of story maps. Absolutely. I, this this calling I saw a side accordion somewhere. I don't remember. Yeah, this is a side accordion. So what I did is different in that <coughs> accordion is just different thing. So you zoom around the map and whatever features are visible on the map that show up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of got you. But it all runs off of JavaScript files that ties into each other, right? Right, yeah. right. And that's it. There's some scripting behind it that ties things together. I don't know if there's any particular one, John, you want to show. I, but there's, you know, you can do the query yourself when you got time back in the office. Just go look at these samples. And, you know, one one example that we did that I don't know if it's still live or not anywhere anymore, but I'll go back and let's... Um, I'll just show it real quick. I don't know. We haven't opened it in ages. And I'm not sure which one of these. We've got a map that we produce copies and distribute it outdoors and parks and rec and all sorts of venues. And it's our river trail down the Catawba River. And it's, you know, tailor made, you know, for a story map. And you've got every one of those points is essentially a portage or an access site along the Catawba River on that trail. And if this is, yeah, you can click and pull up information. You can zoom to get information, all that stuff. So it's basically the brochure and the hard copy here online. And you can get it and access it and use it. Then with the inherent features, you can get navigation and this, that, and the other. Just something to get you thinking about. So. Yeah, come on up. Sir. 